Hello everyone and welcome to U.S. Bank Stadium here for the University of Minnesota Golden Gopher baseball team taking on the University uh, Western Illinois University Leathernecks. Minnesota comes in here uh, playing in their final series again or in U.S. Bank Stadium. And here with Radio K Sports, the call. I am Connor Machner, joined alongside Jason Rutman for this one. Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to another fun Golden Gopher baseball game. Last night, Minnesota's offense really started to shine. They scored 11 runs on a season-high 14 hits. Six players contributed to the success, each of them getting RBIs. Brett Bateman had one RBI, scored four runs. Drew Stahl hit a two-run homer in the first for his RBIs. Chase Stanky contributed. Jack Kelly had a tremendous game, boosting his batting average to above the 400 mark. Otto Grimm had a few nice at-bats, very, very controlled at the plate. Ronnie Sweeney hit an absolute nuclear blast over the right field tarp. And then Brady Council got some playing time, notched his third hit of the season. So the Golden Gophers offense really, really performed yesterday. And of course, they were backed by strong pitching. Sam Ireland improves to 3-0 and on the season. Another excellent performance from him. Yeah, I mean, this has kind of been, you know, not the greatest of starts to a season for the Gophers. They come in at uh, 6 and 15 uh, to start the year. And it was nice to see that offensive explosion and to have some, some real good pitching on their own side, which has been kind of a, a sore spot for them all year. You're absolutely right. The bullpen was able to hold Richie Holitz through some solid innings in relief after Sam Ireland threw six innings strong. Ireland uncharacteristically walked six batters last night, but the Golden Gophers didn't have to pay up much for that. And they ended up taking the victory 11-4 to over Western Illinois University. So now we'll look to the pitching matchup for the Golden Gophers, J.P. Massey. Yeah, J.P. Massey comes in on a little bit of a struggling point that so far this year. His ERA is up at 7.29, which is not where he'd like to have it because he's shown some real good flashes throughout the years that he's been uh, you know, a consistent player. But this ERA is definitely not indicative of what his skill set is. Uh, but he comes in with a record of 1-2. and two. This will be his fifth start of the year. Uh, he's allowed 14 walks in the year and has 21 strikeouts. So, I mean, you'd like to have that ratio not be as close um, with walks to strikeouts. But I think this is going to be a good game for him. Uh, Western Illinois has a tough time scoring runs on offense, and they haven't been all that great so far this year as well just like Minnesota but I think this will be a good a good game to kind of get him level and get him back into the swing of things you're absolutely right he's had two rough outings the last two times he appeared on the mound for the Golden Gophers on March 12th against Air Force he went an inning in a third allowed four earned runs and walked six batters then against Creighton last weekend he went three and two-thirds innings gave up seven runs and four walks while only recording four strikeouts. So he's looking to bounce back here against a Western Illinois team that, like you said, Connor, has some inconsistencies on offense. But the real struggle for them this season has been pitching. They came into this weekend series with a team ERA just a hair under 10 and a half. And on the mound for them today is going to be Jace Warkentian. Yeah, so he comes in with a record of one and three, the loser of three consecutive starts for Western Illinois. Uh, last game, he only made it four and a third innings. He allowed 10 hits and had seven runs, earned runs allowed and one unearned. He walked three and struck out five. And so far, his ERA is pretty similar to what they have as a team. He's at 10.61 for his ERA, which is definitely not where he would like it because he's been, you know, last year he led the team in ERA um, with a total of 4.47. So, you know, he's been kind of up and down to begin this, you know, his career. Um, and this is definitely a game that he would kind of like to have to snap a three-start losing streak for them. Yeah, Warkentian had a great start to the season back on February 19th against Western Kentucky. He went six innings, allowing only three hits and two earned runs, striking out six. But since then, it's been all downhill for Warkentian. At Charlotte, he only went an inning and two-thirds, gave up seven earned runs. Butler, he went six and two-thirds, but still gave up six earned runs. And then 
like you said, Connor, his last time out was against Northern Colorado, went four and a third innings, gave up 10 hits, seven earned runs. So he looks to bounce back here against a Golden Gopher offense that has a lot of power, but also has a tendency to strike out a lot. Yeah, it's definitely been kind of a you know, pun intended, hit or miss for this offensive lineup uh, that does show quite a bit of power. And you know, a couple weeks ago, they had been the leader uh, in home runs for the Big Ten through the non-conference schedule up until about last weekend or so. And so, it, you know, this is a team that does supply quite a bit of power. And like you said, we'll have to find some other ways to start scoring uh, other than just the home run. Taking a look at the batting orders for the two teams, Western Illinois goes with a similar lineup to yesterday with one change. They have Kobe Olsen leading off, Matt Santarelli playing second base, batting second, Nick Mitchell at three, Dylan Sears batting cleanup, Sam Maddox in the five hole, Toby Allred batting sixth. Richmond is in the game today. He was not yesterday. He's going to be batting seventh in the DH spot. Adam Duran behind the dish again in the eight hole. And then Bottoletto, the shortstop, will round out their batting order. And looking ahead to the Gophers here too, they're going to have a similar lineup as well. They'll start out with center fielder Brett Bateman leading off. Then they'll go to Drew Stahl, the shortstop, batting two. Uh, batting third is going to be Chase Stanky, the catcher. Batting fourth is going to be Jack Kelly, the third baseman. Batting fifth will be Otto Grimm, the right fielder. Sixth will be Boston Morella, the second baseman. Uh, batting seventh will be Ronald Sweeney, the first baseman. And then batting eighth will be the DH, Brady Council. And batting ninth, rounding out the lineup for the Gophers will be the left fielder, Andrew Wilhite. The Golden Gophers are likely going to heavily rely on their three big sluggers today, Brett Bateman, Jack Kelly, and Ronnie Sweeney. Sweeney having a slow start to the season, uh, tied for the team lead in strikeouts, but he had a big home run yesterday, a hanging breaking ball that he left no doubt about clearing the tarp in right field and giving the Golden Gophers an even larger lead. In the meantime, Brett Bateman, the only Golden Gopher to start all 21 games this season. Today will be game number 22 that he is in the starting lineup for. He had a great game yesterday. Two stolen bases, reached base four times. He looked really, really strong. Yeah, he's been a really good table setter for this team, which is kind of something that they need. You know, like we said, they rely quite a bit on the long ball. And so, you know, when you're going to be playing games against teams where they're going to be playing in really big ballparks like you are here at U.S. Bank Stadium, and the long ball might not always be the best option or, you know, it'll be tougher to come by. And so you're going to have to generate runs in other ways than just swinging for the fences. And he's going to be someone who's really integral to this team scoring a lot more runs than they do. You're absolutely right. As the Golden Gophers have taken the field going through their pre-inning warm-ups. On the mound, J.P. Massey, 6'5", Chicago, Illinois native, graduated from Gwendolyn Brooks High School, and he came into this season and last, actually, with a lot of hype. In 2021, he was projected to be the number tw excuse me, number 17 MLB draft prospect, according to Perfect Game. This year, he's fallen a little bit. He's in the top 200, but an inconsistent season last year has left him floundering a little bit. Yeah, agreed, and he was also in a rotation behind guys like Max Meyer, who was drafted within the top five uh, of the MLB draft a couple of years ago. And so you look forward to you know him bouncing back. You know he's shown some good flashes of what he can do and why he warrants such a high rating by Perfect Game. And so it's going to be really important to see what he can do to kind of bring back that status that he had and bring his uh, his draft stock back up again. In the on-deck circle right now, waiting for his first at-bat, Corey Olsen. He leads the team in hits, in batting average, and in runs. He's currently hitting at a 343 mark. And he will advance to the plate here as we get underway in Minneapolis. Thank you, Jason. And here, uh, both teams will be um, in similar uniforms to yesterday. Minnesota comes out in their brand new white and gold uniforms. They're all white white top, white pants with gold script Minnesota across the front, which I think are pretty slick. And then you look forward to Western Illinois here who will be in purple jerseys and gray pants. And we are about to get underway. Massey sets. Here's the pitch. It's going to be a ground ball to the shortstop. Fielded. 
Throwing to first. One pitch, one out. Quick start from Massey. For the second game in a row, we see Olsen go after the first pitch that he sees to start off the game. Yesterday, he led off with a double off of Sam Ireland. Today, not as successful. Grounds out to Drew Stahl at short. He has been an excellent defender all season for the Golden Gophers. Really a stalwart there in the hole at short. Up next comes Matt Santarelli, the second baseman. He takes the first one just outside. It's going to be 1 and 0. Oh. Santarelli, a freshman from Homer Glen, Illinois, batting 259 on the season. Here's the next pitch. It's going to be grounded to second, scooped up and thrown to first in plenty of time. And a nice quick two outs on three pitches from Massey. So a pretty solid start. Let's see if he can get out of it in about four, five, six pitches. That'd be pretty nice. Nice job there by Boston Marilla. Ball was hit slowly towards him. He charged it and then set his feet as he was fielding it. Didn't want to overrun it. Gloved it, tossed it over to Sweeney at first. No problem for the Golden Gophers as they roll through the first two batters of the inning. Yeah, this is definitely the start you're looking for for Massey. Even for the Gophers just to get some sort of rebound here. Massey lining up in the center of the rubber. Gets his sign. Deals. First one will be low. It's going to be ball one, one and zero. Oh. The Golden Gophers all season have had some trouble keeping the ball down in the strike zone. Other teams have been able to punish them. They've given up a lot of runs, especially early this year. Here's the next pitch, and it's going to be called strike one on the outside corner. It's going to be knotted up at one and one is the count. Massey has a tendency to throw really, really hard. The question today is, is he going to be able to keep that ball down and under control? That ball was inside outed and it's going to be hit foul down the left field line. So now the count is one and two, and looking to get out of it here is Massey. Let's see if he can use nice off-speed pitch, kind of set him off because he was late on that fastball. Let's see what he does here. Nick Mitchells, the right fielder, he's in the box right now. One and two count, he sets. Massey delivers. On the outside corner, he got him looking. Strike three, beautiful inning from J.P. Massey. He sets them down in order, and Minnesota with a nice start here. Absolutely, the Golden Gophers go one, two, three, and that'll send us into our first commercial break. Minnesota will have their first at-bats coming up in just a moment on Radio K Sports. And welcome back to U.S. Bank Stadium. I'm Connor Mockney, joined alongside Jason Rutman. And we are here for the bottom of the first, where Brett Bateman will be stepping into the box here. The center fielder is leading off, and he's had a pretty good season. He had a couple hits and a couple stolen bases last, st stolen bases last game, pardon me. And he looks to kind of get off on the right ship here to set Minnesota's offense ready. The left-hander on the mound will throw the first one high and outside. Nice eye from Bateman, and it's 1-0. Bateman coming into this game batting 318 with a 409 slugging percentage. As the leadoff hitter, though, batting 444, so a lot of success for him early in the innings here. Fastball inside, 2 0. Good hitters count now for Bateman, who's going to look to try to spark this team, get him out to an early lead after a nice dominant inning from JP Massey. 
Brett Bateman walked twice last night. Shows bunt. Might have been a little bit of a cross up there as he pulled back. And it's going to be 3-0. and And the ball bounced off the catcher. I don't know if he was crossed up or what. Maybe getting ready to feel the potential bunt. But that was a little awkward one. And now it's 3-0. and For Kentian. Ready. Here's the pitch. Automatic take. And it's in for a strike. 3-1. and one. Still a good hitter's count here for Bateman. He can sit on something if he'd like. Doesn't have to swing here. And here comes the next pitch. That one will be in. The zone will be inside, and it's going to be a full count now. Good take there by Brett Bateman. That one on the inside corner, had he swung at that, there's a good chance the ball probably would have kind of handcuffed him, forced him to make a short, choppy swing. No solid contact. And the payoff pitch is low. A nice at-bat from Bateman here as he draws a leadoff walk, which is always bad for the opposition. You never want to walk anybody, especially the leadoff man, who's been really good so far this year. And taking a look back at last game, Brett Bateman walked in the first inning to start off the game. Drew Stahl came up next and hammered the ball over the center field fence to put the Gophers up 2-0. So they look to repeat here as Stahl stands in. As we said, Stahl is in here, and he takes the first pitch low, but for a strike. It'll be 0-1 to begin here. Got to watch out with the lefty on the mound if you're Bateman or anybody else on base because they have some pretty quick moves for sure. Bateman did steal on Jack Bell last night, or at least attempted to. Bell started the game as the opener for Western Illinois, and he was a lefty throwing sidearm, but Bateman did try and take second before the homer by Stahl sent him around the rest of the bases. The next pitch is outside for a ball, so it's one and one. Here's the next pitch. Stanky did go, or Stahl did go, he tried holding up, but could not get there quite in time, and it will be a one and two count. That was a nice pitch there. Kind of got him all, uh, you know, on the off speed. Wasn't quite expecting it and couldn't quite hold up in time. One, two coming. Workington ready. Will throw, and it's going to be a ground ball to third. They're going to throw it to second for one, over to first for a double play. And that wipes away the leadoff walk with a double play. Five, four, three. Nice job there by Olsen over at third base he's already shaded towards the line and that ball was ripped about three feet to the right of third base he's able to shuffle his feet get over make a nice throw to second and western illinois converts on the double play minnesota down to their final out of the bottom half of the first now in stands chase stanky the catcher hitting 240 on the year and he'll take the first one inside for a 1-0 count chase stanky third in the big 10 in home runs hit this season he has seven he also has seven doubles to go along with that here's the one that's going to be grounded to second base scooped up and thrown to first an equally good inning for western illinois as they go one two three and avoid the leadoff walk haunting them we will go to the top of the second still nothing nothing here at u.s bank stadium Rhythm, feel the rhyme, get on the piss box, let's have. Welcome back to U.S. Bank Stadium. Again, I am Connor Machna, joined alongside Jason Rutman here for Radio K Sports. First inning goes pretty quietly, unlike 
la uh, yesterday when Minnesota put up a crooked number on the board in their first ha uh, first part of the inning. It's 0-0 right now, and J.P. Massey looked pretty good last inning. Only six pitches. Yeah, J.P. Massey looked exceptional. Some really solid control from him, forcing the ball to be hit on the ground, and Western Illinois struggled to make solid contact as Massey fooled them with a nice combination of fastballs and off-speed pitches. Stepping in now will be the center fielder Dylan Sears for Western Illinois. He's hitting 313 on the year. He's got 12 runs driven in, and he takes that first pitch for a ball. It'll be 1-0. Coming into yesterday's game, Sears was riding a seven-game hit streak. There, so there is a reason that he's batting in the four spot for this Western Illinois lineup. Next pitch by Massey is a fastball, and it will be in the zone and to even up the count at one. Nice job to not fall behind 2-0 to a dangerous hitter. Massey on the near first base side of the rubber. Winds, throws, and will throw it up and away. Now it's 2-1. and one. And that's been kind of the concern for Massey for parts of this season. He throws so hard that sometimes he sacrifices the control. And it's normal to have a few pitches slip out, but when you're leaving high fastballs in the zone, they're going to get punished. Next pitch is hit to center field, but Bateman is there to track it down. The first piece of good contact by either side so far today, and it's a line out to center. Good job by Bateman. That ball was hooking towards left center field right off the bat. Bateman able to read it, continue to track it, watched it all the way into the glove. Textbook for him. Remember, Brett Bateman, we had the opportunity to talk to him on the Sports Hour podcast, Connor, was a pitcher slash outfielder last year for the Golden Gophers, this year only playing in the outfield. Sam Maddox is in for Western Illinois. He hit one back up the middle that Massey hit with his glove. Tried to throw it to first and did not get him in time. Maddox is pretty fast going up the line, so the first hit of the day for either side comes as a Western Illinois single from Sam Maddox. Good contact there by Maddox. Is able to get most of the ball just a little bit on top of it. Hits it directly back to J.P. Massey, and as he's following through on that long wind-up pitch, he was unable to cleanly field it. It ends up deflecting off of his glove towards the third base side, and... The Leathernecks have a man aboard. Now in stands Toby Allred, their first baseman. He takes the first pitch for a strike. He was looking at a fastball there. Runners, the short lead off at first. Massey set. He's going to throw over to first or pickoff attempt, and it gets away, but it hits the umpire. And now he's going to get into second base with no throw, so now Western Illinois will have a man in scoring position on just a bad throw in the pickoff attempt there. Well, it is harder to throw over to first base for a righty pitcher because you're trying to wind up while you're contorting your body, trying to rotate off the mound. And Massey, standing at six foot five, has those really long, lanky arms, and he just overthrew a little bit there. Thankfully for him, it didn't roll all the way to the padding of the wall as the umpire was in the way. But even still, Maddox able to advance to second, and all of a sudden, Western Illinois is threatening with a runner in scoring position. That next pitch is high. It's 1-1. One and one. And Sam Maddox, who's the runner on second base for the Leathernecks, is 3 of 4 so far this year uh, with attempted steals. He's been successful in 3 of those 4, so at an 80% clip, he is a threat to steal, even though he does hit in the middle of the lineup. Massey set. We'll take a look, kind of creep in from Marilla at second. He's going to throw. Hit one right over the head of Morella into center field. Here comes Maddox. The throw from Bateman is going to go all the way through. They will score. Throw down to second base. It is going to gun them. They're going to get an out on the play. Minnesota will. And a nice throw by Stanky to cut the runner down, trying to advance to second base. But Western Illinois will take a 1-0 lead on that play. Solid piece of contact there for Toby Allred, sending that ball into center field. Bateman with a strong throw home, able to put a lot of his momentum as he ran up to charge that ball behind it, but the throw was about two and a half feet wide of home plate, so the runner able to score easily. Stanky, well aware though that Allred was heading to second base, grabs it and guns him down. The next batter in is going to be the DH, CJ Richmond, and he takes the first pitch outside 1-0 and from Massey, who seems to he didn't have the control issues last inning, uh, but this time they're starting to have these hits find a, a couple holes here 
uh, in this defense, and that next pitch is going to be just outside as well on the fastball, so it's going to be 2-0 and oh on Richmond. Massey with the sign. Sets, comes in. Ground ball to Marilla at second. He scoops it up. He's got plenty of time. We'll throw to first, and that is going to end the inning. Western Illinois strikes on a single from Toby Allred, who then got gunned down at second base, trying to advance. But now Minnesota will have Jack Kelly, Otto Grimm, and Boston Marilla up in the second inning, and we'll be right back here on Radio K Sports. Welcome back to U.S. Bank Stadium. I'm Connor Machner, joined alongside Jason Rutman here for Radio K Sports. We bring you the Minnesota Golden Gopher baseball team going up against the Western Illinois Leathernecks. Western Illinois got on the board last inning with a single, and they now have a 1-0 lead, a lead for the first time in this series. But Jack Kelly, the third baseman from Minnesota, the cleanup hitter, will stand in here to take his first step out of the day. Kelly had a big game yesterday, three for five at the plate, pushing home two runs and also scoring one himself. He's hitting 406 so far on the year, which I'd say it's pretty good. And he takes that first pitch outside, so it's 1-0. and Ahead in the count is Kelly. Workington standing, third base side of the rubber. We'll throw that one inside, and it's going to be a 2-0 count for Kelly. A good hitter's count here for him to potentially drive a fastball if he can get it. Entire infield playing deep with the exception of the third baseman, Olsen. Kelly, someone with a lot of power for this Golden Gopher squad. Here's the pitch. Fouled it straight back. He was kind of sitting on it. Got it and couldn't quite do much with it, and he put it straight back into the netting behind home plate. It's 2-1. and one. Workington goes kind of fast. He gets the ball and gets right back on the rubber, and he's ready to go. He was waiting on Kelly there. As he winds up, here's the pitch. Chopped to first. He can be brought there himself for a th uh, unassisted out by the first baseman. That's Toby Allred who took it himself, and Kelly is retired. Orkentian's done a really nice job this game, forcing the Golden Gophers to hit the ball on the ground. The outfielders have probably been bored for Western Illinois. No action for them. The infielders, however, have been very busy. We've seen the ball sprayed all across the infields, but... Nothing has gotten through yet. The Golden Gophers still searching for their first hit. In comes Otto Grimm, who puts a bunt down. Didn't quite get it that far, and the catcher, uh, Huron, will throw him out uh, pretty easy. Didn't quite get much on that bunt. He tried bunting for a hit. And didn't get much on. Just kind of laid there for the catcher to pop out and get it. Well, Grimm kind of attempted a uh, swinging bunt there as he dropped the bat down, started moving down to first as the bat made contact with the ball. Unfortunately, that took away his ability to push the bunt in a certain direction and ended up rolling about five feet in front of home plate instead of down one of the lines and an easy play for Adam Duran. In comes Boston Marilla, the second baseman for Minnesota and he takes the first pitch up and outside. He's a right-handed batter coming in. That is a ball, so ball one here on Marilla. We're Kentian ready. Here's the pitch. Chopped down to third will go foul. So 
the count will now be tied up at one with two outs here in the bottom of the second inning. Boston Merrill, a very, very good contact hitter for Minnesota. He's one of those batters that irritates pitchers because he'll hit so many foul balls in a row just waiting for a mistake. And then when a pitcher finally throws one over the plate, he makes contact and sends it into one of the gaps a fair amount of the time. And that pitch here, he looked like he was swinging for the gaps too, but he ended up just getting a piece of it and fouling it back. So now the count will be one and two. Set in the box where Kenton is ready. Here's the pitch. Swing, and he's going to line that one into left center. It's going to get down. Center fielder's going to cut it off, and Marilla will stay at first for Minnesota's first hit of the day. Right on cue there. You called it, Jason. He put a good piece on it, and he put it into the outfield for the first hit of the game. Well, he fouled two or three pitches off there before finally seeing one that he liked. Squared it up, hit a sharp liner over the head of the shortstop and into left center. Real nice play by Dylan Sears in center field for the Leathernecks, cutting that one off. Merlo took a wide turn at first, but was unable to advance to second thanks to Sears' efforts. In stands Ronald Sweeney, the first baseman for Minnesota. Lefty on lefty matchup here, and that first pitch will be too high for Morkentian, so 1 0 is the count here. Merilla has yet to attempt a stolen base on the season. He's got a very conservative lead over there at first, very short because of the lefty. Where Kentian looks, he's going to deal home. That one's going to be swung and hit hard into the right field corner, but will get out of play. Good piece, but just a little too early from Sweeney, and it's one and one. Well, that pitch must have looked like a cantaloupe to Sweeney. He squared that one up really strong. Early on the swing, the off-speed pitch nearly punished again. He hit a homer yesterday off of a hanging off-speed pitch. 1-1 one is the count. We're Kentian ready. Off goes Mer Merrilla. He's going to attempt to steal a throw. Down is in time. And Merrilla is out. And that will retire the side. Ronald Sweeney will lead off next inning. We'll get a fresh at bat. But the attempted steal goes for nothing. And that will end the inning. And we will head to another commercial break here on Radio K. Western Illinois up 1-0 after 2. Welcome back to the top of the third here at U.S. Bank Stadium. I'm Connor Mockney, joined alongside Jason Rutman here for Radio K Sports. Western Illinois is up one to nothing after two. J.P. Massey had a pretty easy first inning. Second inning ran into a little bit of trouble, which seems to be kind of a consistent theme for a lot of this pitching staff. And in stands the Western Illinois catcher Adam Duran. And that ground ball is right back to Massey, who will underhand flip it to first. One pitch, one out. Nice start to the third. J.P. Massey has now seen two balls hit right back at him. First one that he's been able to glove cleanly. And that'll bring up Derek Bottoletto, the nine hitter for Western Illinois. He plays shortstop, and he has some speed on him, but contact has been an issue for him this year as he hits a lot of balls on the ground. That first pitch will be an off-speed pitch, down and in, but will catch the zone. So first pitch strike from Massey, which is what you want to see more consistently in this inning as he kind of struggled with that last inning. 
sets. Here's the next pitch. It's down, and the count will be evened up at one. Massey ready again. Here comes the 1-1. Outside to the left-handed hitter, Bottoletto. It's going to be a 2-1 count here. Close pitch there. Stanky did a nice job framing it, but did not get the call. Here's the next pitch. Will catch the zone. Attempted hold up there by Bottoletto, but the ball caught the zone anyway, and it's tied up at two. So now this is where Massey might go to an off-speed pitch, knowing that Bottoletto has some speed. If he can get it to stay in the infield, that would be helpful. Speaking of, here it is, a little dribbler up the first baseline. Massey had it, and he took his eye off it too early, and Bottoletto will reach on what they will call the second error of the game, assessed to Massey. A weak contact there by Bottoletto, hits the ball about 45 feet up the first baseline before it dies. Massey quick off the mound, looked to scoop it up and fire over to first, but he took his eye off the ball like you said there, Connor, and ended up touching it with his fingertips but never actually grabbing it. Bottoletto will reach error assessed to the pitcher his first of the season for J.P. Massey. Runner on first with a pretty good lead as the top of the order comes back over. Pickoff attempt. Bottoletto will get back. Bottoletto four for five on steals this season. Stanky does have a good arm behind the plate for the Golden Gophers, but he was unable to catch any runners stealing yesterday. Really big lead over there at first for Bottoletto. And they do throw over yet again, keeping him honest. Bottoletto does get back in time. He's probably a good 10, 11 feet off the bag there, Connor. Really aggressive, trying to get into J.P. Massey's head. Yeah, this is not a lead you see unless you're a really good base stealer, which Bottoletto is. And they throw for a third time in a row. No tag applied by Sweeney. And I, you, they're really, uh, really watching out for him here because he definitely is a threat and was someone who puts the ball in play like Olsen quite often. This is a recipe for some sort of hit and run play, I'm sure. Massey, set, will deliver home. And it's a first pitch strike. He got that one in. Looks like Olsen didn't quite like that call. In the meantime, I think that the pitch call was really good. Going with the fastball, getting the ball home quicker in order to help Stanky get it down to second in a more rapid time. Had Bottoletto taken off. Bit of a smaller lead from Bottoletto. Only about a step back or so. Massey will step off and look. No throw. Bottoletto goes back. 0-1 is the count on the leadoff hitter, Corey Olson, for Western Illinois. Drew Stahl shaded over towards second base from his normal shortstop position, getting ready to cover the throw down. Here goes Bottoletto on the steal. The ball's outside. Throw is down. And with that last second skip, off the turf, the tag did not come down in time, and Bottoletto with his four, fourth steal of the year, and he is now in scoring position for the top of the lineup. Strong throw there by Stanky, right on the money, but you said it, Connor. Just a little bit short. He spiked it into the dirt about five feet in front of the bag. Nice job corralling it there by Drew Stahl and getting the tag on, but about a half second too late. Runner in scoring position now. 1-1 is the count on that ball that was just thrown by Massey. He gets set. Looking over, no attempt to throw to second base. He will step off and look, but no one is there. The shortstop stall is a good six feet behind the runner, and he kind of walked off now back to his normal shortstop position when Massey stepped off. Now Massey set again. To the right-handed hitting Olsen. Here's the pitch. Off speed is inside. 2-1 the count. Right now, Massey's up to 24 pitches. So pretty, pretty good so far through two and a third. Would like to get a quick out here. Massey sets. Glances at second. Stall backs off. Here's the pitch. It gets by Stanky quickly. Not far enough for Bottoletto to attempt any sort of steal. And it's going to be 3-1 is the count as Stanky now goes out and brings in his infield to talk with his pitcher. 
I think that Stinky got crossed up there because that pitch looked like it was pretty close to being right over the plate. I think that that could have gone either way in terms of ball or strike, but because it got past him, the umpire deemed it to be a ball. However, he didn't seem ready for that pitch. I think he was looking for a fastball and got something off speed. Yeah, it definitely looked like a pretty awkward reception there. And considering that, you know, Stanky's a pretty good defensive catcher, the fact that he didn't get that one or was crossed up says a little something about the communication. Now they go back. It's a 3-1 count here to the leadoff hitter. Massey with the pitch. Foul back. Watch your lips on the, uh, the on-deck circle for Western Illinois. Now it's a full count. Olsen grounded out to the shortstop in his first plate appearance, so that makes the stolen base at second by Bottoletto even more important because if he were to do that again, it would likely result in an inning-ending double play. Yeah, that is. That's why that speed at the bottom of the lineup, or just anywhere in the lineup, is really important. Massey set, full count with one out. Here's the pitch. Swing and a drive to right field, but well foul. And we'll do the payoff pitch yet again. J.P. Massey really working this inning. Western Illinois seems to be right on top of him and his cadence here as they're timing him up pretty well. Yeah, not many bad swings from this team so far outside of that first inning. The second and third inning so far have been pretty good for their offense. Now here's the payoff pitch. Be hit down the right field line and into the corner. That's going to score Bottoletto. Digging for two is Olsen, and that's where he's going to stop as the throw gets into the cutoff man, Marilla. And it's a one-out double to make it a 2 nothing lead for the Leathernecks. Second double in two days for Olsen. Squares this one up a little bit late in the swing. Shoots it down the line past a diving Sweeney at first base. That one rolls all the way to the corner, and he heads to second, pushing the runner home. It's 2 nothing for Western Illinois as they jump on top of the Golden Gophers early. Mark Santorelli, the second baseman, the two-hitter, will step into the box now. He grounded out to second base in his first at-bat back in the first. Here's the pitch. He shows bunt, will pull back, and will take a strike. It's 0-1 for Massey. Santorelli grounded out to the second baseman, Merrilla, his first time up. The first inning success for J.P. Massey seems to have faded away. Yeah, very quickly. Western Mich Illinois found something real quick to figure him out, and that off-speed pitch will be taken for a strike. It's 0-2 for Massey. I think it's really important that he either gets a strikeout or just some sort of out here on this next pitch when the middle of the order comes up. You want to have two outs. Massey, ready. Glances at second. Glances again. Now delivers home. Ground ball will go to third. It will be foul. So they'll do the 0-2 pitch yet again as Jack Kelly was there to scoop it up. I'd like to see, you know, he, he's gone to the off-speed pitch quite a bit. I'd like to see if he can put a fastball up and in, you know, at least a high fastball up for the right-handed hitter here. But the only problem was that is you can't leave it too, uh, you know, not high enough, you can't leave it too low. Massey sets, glances at second. Here's the 0-2 pitch. Swing and a miss on an off-speed pitch. He got him. That's his first K of the day. And that's going to be out number two here in the third. A really important out there for J.P. Massey with Nick Mitchell coming up to the plate now for Western Illinois. Mitchell, one of the few players on this Western Illinois team that has a combination of both contacts and power. He's a true freshman, though, so... Massey has the upper hand as the more experienced senior pitcher. And pardon me, that was the second strikeout out of the day. The first strikeout came in Mitchell's first at-bat when he was caught looking to end the first. And a, just keeping um, Olsen honest there as Massey stepped off and faked a pickoff to second. Just keeping him in check. Stahl still well behind him. So really no threat of any sort of pickoff at second. Massey's still off the rubber. Now he gets on. He'll get his sign. Come set. Glance. And here's the pitch. It's going to be in for strike one. Nice job getting ahead in the count here. 
which is, like we said, something that was a bit of a problem in that second inning and looks to have kind of found that first pitch strike yet again. Massey to the left-handed hitting Mitchell. He gets set. Still looks at that runner at second. Nothing happening there and will deliver home. And that fastball is up and away and will be out of the zone. Count tied up at one. Golden go for defense. Shifted a little bit to the first base side to account for Mitchell, who is a pull hitter. Boston Marilla playing really deep past the white line marking the edge of the infield in right center. Here's the 1-1, and that will be outside 2-1 and one now. As Massey lost the advantage there after the first pitch strike. Let's see what he does to kind of even up this count again. I'd like to see him go back. Uh, to some sort of off speed, but he's been trying to set it up with an, uh, a fastball away. Hasn't quite gotten it there. Massey sets, looks at second. Will deliver. And here's a hit into the left center gap. It's slicing in and a diving grab out there by Andrew Wilhite. He reels it in and saved another run going up on the board. And Minnesota gets out of it on a nice diving play by Wilhite, but not after Western Illinois puts another one up on the board. And it's 2-0 at the end of uh, the top of the third. Welcome back to the bottom of the third here at U.S. Bank Stadium. We have the bottom of the lineup coming up with Ronald Sweeney leading off the third here. And this has been a, a sore spot for Minnesota's lineup is the bottom half. You're absolutely right. As Sweeney shows bunt, tries to lay it down. Interesting there for the 6'3 big man. But the Golden Gophers, bottom of the lineup, has really, really struggled so far this season. Sweeney batting 217, Council. 167, Will Height, a team low, 159. Compare that to the middle three hitters of the lineup. Kelly batting 400, Grimm batting 270, Boston Marilla 284. So there's a significant drop up for the final three batters here. The Golden Gophers looking to remedy that against Jace Warkentian, who has looked strong to start this game. Yeah, he has. He's been pitching quick too. He's been getting on the mound and just throwing them. And that next pitch was outside, so the count is one and one. Sweeney takes his time getting back into the box where Kentian was waiting for him. Now the lefty delivers. It'll be inside. A good good eye by Sweeney there as the count is now two and one. Well, the Leatherneck dugout not happy with that call as saw a lot of palms facing skywards asking the home plate umpire where was that pitch. But good take by Sweeney. That one looked to be a slider. Where Kentian's next pitch. Sweeney is well out in front and puts it back behind uh, the catcher for a foul ball. It'll be 2-2 two and two is the count now. Haven't had um, much good contact so far outside of that Marilla hit. And Sweeney looks to change that here with the 2-2 two -two pitch coming in. Where Kentian delivers. And a swing and a miss. Sweeney goes down on a high fastball. And that will retire him for the first out of the inning. Frustrations at the plate continue for Ronnie Sweeney. It's his 22nd strikeout of the season. The Gophers have only played 21 games. He hasn't even played in all of them. So 
The frustrating outing for him continues. Last year, he led the Golden Gophers in home runs and RBIs. This year, struggling to make solid contact at the plate. Here comes the right-handed Brady Council, who is aforementioned hitting 167 on the year. Doesn't have any home runs and has one RBI driven in. He takes the first pitch for a ball. It'll be 1-0. Where Kentian delivers here at the second pitch, and that one will go into the left-handed batter's box for ball two. Easy take for Council. Be really important to, like you said, get this bottom of the lineup going to add a little bit more threat and consistency to what the top can do. And the 2-0 pitch will be look to be a little outside, but where Kentian and the Leathernecks get the benefit of the call, and it's two and one. Delivers again, and that one is in for a strike. Count evened up on Council at two and two. And that's one that Council is going to want back. That was a heater right down the middle of the plate. And he was taking that thing all the way. This is only Council's 19th at bat of the season. So you have to wonder about how confident he is in there. It takes some time to warm up to college baseball. Remember Brady Council, a freshman. But he was able to get on base last night, hit a single, and is looking for his fourth hit of the season here. And he, he took the first pitch there as a ball. But then that one he tried to sell. The payoff pitch he tried selling, and he gets rung up by the home plate umpire on what looked to be a, a pitcher's pitch type of call there. And there's now two down for the Gophers here in the third. I would agree with that statement. Connor pitch looked like it was a little bit inside, but the Leathernecks had a pitch earlier in the at-bat that they didn't like that got called in favor of Minnesota, and there they get their, a call of their own. And it's two strikeouts and two straight batters faced for Wark Hentian as he looks to put the Gophers down 1-2-3 with Andrew Willite at the plate. Down 0-1 is Willite and he hits that one deep in the left. It will go foul and out of play. So now 0-2 is Willite and he hit that to the one fan who's sitting in about all those sections over there out by the bullpen and he hit it right to him like the exact seat There's, which is kind of cool. That is unbelievable. There is quite literally no one out there and speaking of no one out there, there's going to be no one on the bases this inning for Minnesota as Will Height strikes out swinging. A nice 1 2 3 inning from Warkentian. And we will head to the top of the fourth and Jason Rutman taking over as we will be right back here on Radio K Sports. Back here for the top of the fourth inning, the Golden Gophers trailing the Western Illinois Leathernecks by a score of two to nothing, due up for the Golden Gophers, excuse me, the Leathernecks. They will have Dylan Sears, Sam Maddox, and then the first baseman, Toby Allred. On the mound for Minnesota, J.P. Massey continues. This is gonna be the 40th pitch of the game for him. None of the runs scored by Western Illinois have been earned. Gophers have two errors that resulted in that first pitch. A heater right down the middle for strike one. Last time Sears was up, he hit a line drive to the center fielder Bateman, who made a nice play on it and retired him pretty easily. Sears stands in, and an off-speed pitch comes in low. He's a senior this year for what is a relatively young Western Illinois team, only one of three seniors in the lineup. 
Allred and Olsen, the other two, as he'll take this pitch outside and high for ball two. Two and one is the count. Two runs, three hits, no errors for Western Illinois. No runs, one hit, two errors for the Golden Gophers. Showing bunt and chopping it foul is Sears there. Two and two is the count. The Golden Gophers all playing deep in the infield with the exception of Kelly at third base. And even he's playing at pretty standard positioning. I was going to say, thank goodness he didn't get that bunt down because Sweeney was an absolute no position to even get to that ball. It would be close. Kicking the 2-2. Swing and a miss. Strike three. J.P. Massey puts another K on the board, his third of the game. And Sears will grab some pine. Yeah, that was a good pitch by him. It was a nice inside off-speed pitch. That looked to be like a slider in to the left-hander, and it really tied him up, and that was a nice start to the inning by Massey. Sam Maddox stands in the right-handed batter's box now. Freshman batting 360 on the season, nine hits and 25 at-bats, singled in the first inning, or excuse me, in the second inning, his first plate appearance. First hit of the game for Western Illinois. And he ended up coming around to score to put up the first run of the game for him, too. Hits this one sharply to short, fielding it on the backhand is stall, throwing over to first. In time, a bang-bang play. Sweeney using all of his 6-3 frame to stretch out and pick that one out of the air. An excellent defensive play by the Maroon and Gold, and they now have two outs on the board. It got him by an eyelash, too. That was a really close play, a bang-bang, as you said. And getting the benefit of the call is the Gophers. So that'll bring up the first baseman, Allred. He hit an RBI single in the first and takes ball one outside here. Allred has 10 RBIs on the season following that single in his first plate appearance. Second pitch of this at bat in there for strike one. Massey, quick back to the mound, fires this one. Fouled off, might have caught a piece of Stanky. He appears to be okay. I like the pace that both these pitchers are going at. They're kind of getting on the mound and getting ready to go, throwing these hitters off, not allowing them to really get in the box and get themselves set like they usually would. Well, there is a 20-second pitch clock here, but has not really been utilized much by either pitcher as a slider comes in low. Good block by Stanky. Count two and two. I think... Western Illinois kind of knows it. Massey likes going to the off speed there when he's got two strikes. Deals. Strike three swinging. Two Ks in the inning for J.P. Massey, and he sits down three leathernecks in a row. We'll head to the gopher at bats in the bottom of the fourth when we come back on Radio K Sports. Back here at U.S. Bank Stadium, the Golden Gophers still trailing two to nothing, but they will have three of their best hitters up to start the bottom of the fourth. Brett Bateman, Drew Stahl, and Chase Stanky. Bateman walked in his first plate appearance to lead off the game. He'll stand in the left-handed batter's box here. Open stance, and the first pitch is a curveball dropped in for strike one. 
I think this is the guy you want up at the plate to kind of get your offense started. He's been that table setter all year. Orkentian ready to deal his 39th pitch of the game. This one, a fastball outside for ball one. Orkentian struggled in his last three starts as we talked about in our pregame segment. Connor, six plus runs allowed in each of the last three times he took the mound, but he's looked sharp here against the Golden Gophers as Bateman bloops this one into left. It'll get down. Minnesota has their second hit of the game. The leadoff man aboard Brett Bateman continues to be hot this season, 29th hit of the year in 22 games. Yeah, he did a nice job taking it inside pitch and taking it to left field, not pulling it, getting out in front. Nice job letting his hands get deep and he ended up hitting it the other way for a nice solid base hit to lead off the inning. That'll bring up Drew Stahl. He grounded into a 5-4-3 double play following the Bateman walk in the first. Stands in and we won't get a pitch here as they check over on Bateman at first, keeping him honest. Yeah, and he's been a really good uh, base stealer so far this year. He's uh, stolen 9 of 10 out of the attempts that he's had, so a pretty good conversion rate for him. He had two in yesterday's game against Western Illinois as this pitch fired in there for strike one. High in the zone, looked like it came across the numbers and Stahl held off. Yeah, that was a nice pitch to even up the uh, get ahead in the count here is where Kentian is really looking to keep continue his dealing. Third baseman playing in, preparing for the bunt and small ball as another fastball high for ball one. Second baseman Santorelli playing only about seven feet off of the second base bag, but probably 15 feet deep. Shortstop Bottoletto, where you would expect him to be. No shift for the outfield. First baseman all red holding the runner on. This one hit into the gap in right center. It's going to get down. This will send the runner to third. And holding up at first is Drew Stahl. So Minnesota with a great opportunity here. Two on, no outs with Chase Stanky up. Yeah, that was a beautifully executed hit and run. Bateman got a really, really good jump on that pitch off a of lefty nonetheless, and Stahl was able to take it into deep center and allow Bateman to get the third. So a really good opportunity here with the meat of your lineup coming up, and you want to put some runs up, at least one here. Mitchell made an elite defensive play, hustling over, cutting that ball off. I thought for sure that was going to be a double right off the bat, but... Mitchell prevented that. So runners on the corners for the Golden Gophers. Strike one in there to Chase Stanky. I think that was also a pitch he might want to have back there. That seemed like a pretty good fastball first pitch, something he might want to jump on. But now he's going to wait to see some more here. Lefty on lefty matchup. Warkentian in trouble for the first time today. He deals. This one skied to left field. It's going to be playable for Maddox. Bateman ready to tag, here he comes. Throw home, way off the mark, and the Golden Gophers get their first run of the game. A sack fly from Chase Stanky will push home Brett Bateman from third, and Drew Stahl also tagged up from first on the throw from Sam Maddox, which was way off line. The Golden Gophers chop the Leatherneck lead in half. It's two to one here in Minneapolis. That was a nice heads-up play by Stahl. Take second base. Can be kind of risky, especially depending on where it's cut off. It was cut off at third, but he had a really good jump on it too, so it was a really nice play to move up and put another runner in scoring position. That'll bring up Jack Kelly, the four-hitter for the Golden Gophers, playing third base in today's game. He'll take the first pitch inside. Kelly grounded out to first base, an unassisted ground out in his first plate appearance to lead off the second inning. Has a runner on second who he can potentially drive in. Has a team high 24 RBIs this season. No one else even close to him. Second highest on the team, 17. He readies. Pitch on the outside corner, deemed to be a ball. That one looked very, very close. That was a really good eye by Kelly there. If that were me, I probably would have swung at it, but Kelly with a really good eye, and that's why he's hitting 400. Kelly has a solid approach at the plate. Stands similar to Bateman with that open stance in the left-handed batter's box. Front foot about six inches closer to first base than his back foot, and he'll swing a big chop here, not even close, strike one. That was a swing. He was looking to put that ball up into the moon. 
he had all his power behind that, but again, couldn't quite catch up to that pitch by Warkentian. No outfield shift for the Leathernecks infield. Slightly moved over towards the first base side. Count is two and one, one out, runner on second, and time called. I wonder what that was about. Third base umpire was uh, signaling for something. Can't quite make out what it was, but nonetheless, they get back in the box. Kelly stands in. A chance to tie the game here. The Golden Gophers already have one run here in the bottom of the fourth. This pitch high to Kelly, 3-1 count. This is really good hitter's count. And again, you don't have to swing here because you will get an extra pitch if it is a strike. So Kelly can be selective and look for something to drive. On deck is the junior, Otto Grimm. 0 for 1 in today's game, batting 270 on the season. Kicking the 3-1, strike two swinging. Kelly looked like he pulled his head on that one. And he'll take a second to reset himself here. He looked to be a little out ahead. I don't think he was uh, looking for that pitch that came in. Orkentian set. Count is full. Payoff pitch. Here it comes. Swing on and fouled off by Kelly. I think he looks to be a little out ahead. Um, a lot of those pitches he's way, way out in front of. So there's got to be some sort of change in his approach to kind of recenter and wait back a little bit. Kelly batting 345 with runners in scoring position this season, so slightly lower than his normal average of 400 on the dot. Leads the Big Ten in slugging percentage, 786 coming into this at bat. They try and pick off the runner at second. The throw hits the bag and sprinting around to third is stall. He'll make the turn towards home and he'll hustle back as the right fielder Mitchell cut that ball off and made a beautiful throw to the catcher Adam Duran, preventing Stall, he was about 20 feet around third base before putting on the brakes and heading back to the bat. And he did fall there on this turf, and it was a pretty good throw. Uh, it was on the line, and so probably a good thing that he didn't try to attempt to go home, but now Kelly doesn't have to get a base hit to bring him home here either. Infield playing in. A ground ball will come home to Duran. Kicking 3-2, ball four, pitch low in the dirt, blocked by Duran. But again, the Golden Gophers, an excellent opportunity to uh, put more runs on the board here. Runners on the corners, one out. Otto Grimm stepping up to the plate. There's going to be a meeting out on the mound now, possibly to, to discuss what they're going to do um, defensively, how to set up, what kind of shift they're going to have. As no one's up in the bullpen, so this isn't, you know, trying to get time for a reliever to come in. This, like, like we said, the first time that Werkentian has faced any sort of adversity in this game as he's been able to fly through three-plus innings. In the meantime, Otto Grimm seems to have caught fire, especially in yesterday's game. Three for four, two RBIs, and a run scored for him. He struck out one time. That was the only time he didn't reach base in the 11-4 win over Western Illinois yesterday for Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, this is, like we said, the part of the lineup that you want up. You know, even after Grimm, you have Boston Merrilla, who had a really nice hit as the first hit of the game for the Gophers earlier in this game. And so, looking ahead now, you got the right guys up, that's for sure. So you have to just be able to capitalize here and not only tie it, but potentially take the lead. That'd be best case scenario. The meeting on the mound has come to an end. The grim at bat will start with runners on the corners, one out. The Golden Gophers trailing by a score of 2-1 to one here at U.S. Bank Stadium. The corners playing in. The middle infielders playing relatively deep as a check over to first will lead Drew Stahl down the line from third base, but he'll be given a glare by all red from first, and he'll head back to the bag. A double play depth from both of the, the middle infielders here. 
outfield playing a little bit shallower than normal also as this one ripped past the shortstop and into left field. The Golden Gophers will tie the game. Otto Grimm comes through for Minnesota. It's 2-2. Two to two. A nice job by Grimm taking it the other way and finding that hole in between uh, third and short. You had the shortstop playing over to cover the steal and uh, the, plenty of room there on the left side and he found the hole to tie up this game. And now Boston Marilla will approach for Minnesota. One for one on the day, singled in the second inning to left field. Gophers have runners on first and second. Here's a kick in the pitch, this one in the dirt, blocked by Duran. Still only one out. Minnesota has now taken the lead in hits. They have four compared to the Leathernecks three. Score tied at two apiece. Minnesota jumped out to an early 3-0 lead yesterday. It was 4-1 by the end of the second. They trailed early in this one. This one hit softly to third, scooped up, fired over to first in time for out number two, but it will advance the runners. So Boston Marilla still contributing to the Golden Gopher offense, even though he will have an out next to his name in the scorebook. So that'll bring up Ronald Sweeney, struck out in his first plate appearance. Big time slugger for this Golden Gopher team. Had nine homers last year. 30 RBIs to go alongside that. This year, four home runs and six RBIs. This is the perfect opportunity for him to maybe get himself going after a disappointing, not only start to the season, but first at bat in this game. Kicking the pitch, swung on, strike one. The off-speed pitches have not been kind to Sweeney. He struggles to time them and he looks very discombobulated at the plate when facing one. Yeah, he was well out ahead of that one, that's for sure. Not not the kind of swing you want in the first pitch of an A-B. Sweeney batting a lowly 143 with two outs in an inning. Dials himself in here, gets ready, and the fastball outside for ball one. Yeah, nice eye by him. Wouldn't have been able to do much with that pitch if had he made contact, so it was a good take. Orkenti and Reddy on the mound. He sets, takes a look over at second, comes home with it, catches the outside corner, strike two. An opportunity to leave two runners stranded for Jace Warkenti and here he's one strike away from getting the final out of the fourth and sending his team back to the plate with a tie game. Minnesota looking to take the lead. 1-2 count. Sweeney takes the pitch. That one off speed, a little bit inside, potentially a little bit low. 2-2. Two and two. Where Kentian's pitch count has inflated now to about 57 pitches. So good job by Minnesota in this inning to rack up a lot of pitches on his number. Infield shaded over towards the first base side for the pull hitter Sweeney. Stands tall in the box, only a little bit of bend in his knees. Here comes the pitch. This one high. We have a full count. I anticipate Sweeney to be on the attack here, looking for something to hit. Obviously got to protect anything close, but I look for him to be in an aggressive mindset to take something into the outfield. I would be shocked if they throw him a fastball here. He has not looked good on the off-speed pitches, as I mentioned a moment ago. Kicking the 3-2, it is a fastball, it is inside, it is ball four. Bases loaded now as they bring up the freshman Brady Council. This is a good opportunity to make a name for himself too. Got bases loaded with a tie game. Can get yourself a lot more plate appearances if you can drive in a couple of runs to give your team the lead here. Council struck out looking in his first plate appearance in the third inning. Stands in the right-handed batter's box. Bases loaded opportunity for him. First pitch just off the outside corner, ball one. No shift for the infield here. Outfield playing at standard depth as well. Small leads on the bases for the Golden Gophers even though none of the infielders are holding them on. Kicking the pitch, this one. Again, just outside Western Illinois doesn't like the call. 
It was close, that's for sure. It was a very, very close pitch, but now it's a good hitter's count. Righty v. lefty batter versus pitcher matchup. This one hits sharply to right. It's going to get down. That's going to be extra bases. The Gophers will take the lead. Council around first, heading to second. The runner from first will hold up at third. Minnesota scores two on an RBI double from the freshman Brady Council. They put four runs on the board so far in the fourth inning. And that'll bring up Andrew Wilhite looking to continue the rally for Minnesota. Yeah, and again, no one in the bullpen warming up. So this is where Kentian's jammed to get out of for Western Illinois, but a nice job by Council to take it the other way, hit it into the right field corner, and deliver a really big hit for his team. Andrew Wilhite also struck out in the third inning, part of a three strikeout inning for War Kentian. Stands in here, swings at the first pitch he sees, fouls it off towards the Leatherneck bullpen down the first baseline. This is also a good opportunity for Will Height, a left-hander, in a tough lefty-lefty matchup to look for, to put something in play. Just any sort of contact here would be a good idea. Will Height, only 11 hits and 70 at-bats this season, has 23 strikeouts. Takes a fastball in the outside corner for strike two. 0-2 is the count. The Golden Gophers took the lead just a moment to go on a council double to right field. They now have runners on second and third. Leading the game four to two. Kicking the pitch. This one hit sharply to center. It's gonna be playable and it will be Sears getting under it to make the grab. The Golden Gophers leave two runners stranded but they put four on the board in the fourth inning taking a 4-2 lead. The Leathernecks will look to respond in the top of the fifth when we return on Radio K Sports, Real Sports Radio. Bunker, things you've read and found. If you know of life fed off of you, the people, the trees. The things we can't see Would you still mosey about Dragging your feet Would you dance Golden Gophers put four runs on the board to take a 4-2 lead just a few moments ago capitalized by Brady Council two RBI double up now for Western Illinois in the top of the fifth. It's going to be C.J. Richmond, the designated hitter, donning number 42. Still pitching for the Golden Gophers, J.P. Massey at 51 pitches. And the 52nd of the game to start off the inning is low and inside for ball one. And this is going to be a really important inning for Massey and the Gophers defensively here. you got the bottom of the order coming up for Western Illinois. This one hit sharply up the middle. That's through past second base and into center. The first hit of the game for Richmond. Puts a runner on with no outs. It'll bring up Adam Duran, the catcher, batting in the eight hole for Western Illinois. Duran grounded out to Massey in his first plate appearance of the game. Richmond on first, not exactly... A stealing threat has not attempted one this year. He's asked for time in order to tie his shoe. 
is going to be a really important out. You have to get Duran, who's hitting a, a buck seventy-five on the year so far. Before you get to Bottoletto, who's made some noise for uh, Western Illinois throughout the season in this game. Kicking the pitch to start off the at bat, off speed in the dirt, ball one. A fake bunt there too, from Duran, that drew in the third baseman, but it was retracted. No shift for the Golden Gophers with the exception of Sweeney, who's holding the runner on at first. This one hit pretty well to center field, going back, tracking, and making the grab as Bateman turns and fires in towards the diamond in order to prevent the runner from tagging up. Out number one as Duran makes solid contact but comes up with nothing to show for it. That was a nice job by Bateman there in center two to read that. He waited for a second, got a good look at where the ball was going to go, and then ended up tracking it to the spot in deep center field. Bottoletto batting 313 on the season, reached on an error by Massey in his first plate appearance, stands in the left-handed batter's box and takes the first pitch he sees for ball one. Yeah, this is a dangerous guy at the plate. We know he hits in the nine spot, but sometimes uh, old school managers like to use that nine spot to be like a second leadoff guy uh, to flip it back over to the top of the lineup and make some noise. Andy Pasco, the man at the helm for this Western Illinois squad is pitch number two, blocked expertly by Stanky. That one came in with some heat low and inside on Bottoletto. Andy Pasco, the seventh head coach in Leatherneck team history, named to the position in 2019, so it's his third season guiding them as Stanky calls time in order to confer with Massey and his two middle infielders, Marilla and Stahl. Something I always find interesting about this place, too, is whenever you play at U.S. Bank Stadium, obviously it's all turf, and there's no like real dirt out in the field here. So I wonder if that makes any sort of difference, especially when you're sliding or diving, something like that. Does it hurt a little bit more? Or I don't know what it is. Well, the big concern here, at least in my opinion, is the warning track. It's only marked by a solid yellow line. There's no different texture under players' feet as Bottoletta lays down a bunt towards third base. Kelly bare hands, tosses over to first in time. Looks like Bottoletto is going to argue with the umpire, and out comes their manager, Pasco, and he is furious with the first base umpire. Well, Pasco, very animated out there at first base. It was a great play by Jack Kelly, charging that bunt down the third base line, grabbing it barehanded and whipping it over to first. It was a bang-bang play, tough to see from up here in the booth, but it did look like he got him to me. Agreed. We haven't seen any replay out on the big scoreboard and left, but... I mean, also, I would assume that it looked like, at least to me, that he had gotten him as well. Pasco still out there, standing in foul territory, about three feet from the first base bag, pleading his case. He'll now dejectedly walk back to the dugout with a few more words for the first base umpire. And he came out storming, too. He was bolting up the line, getting to the first base umpire there, trying to plead his case. Well, Bottoletto immediately started to argue as well. He was certain that he beat that one out. However, the call remains unchanged. Two outs, runner on second base is Richmond, the designated hitter who singled to center to start the inning. And it'll bring up the top of the order in Olsen, who takes strike one, a curveball that ended up finding the middle of the plate. Last time Olsen was up, he had an RBI double to right field, which drove in a run that made it 2-0 at that point. Olsen stands in and takes a hack at this pitch. Foul ball towards the Golden Gopher dugout. The dugouts here are interesting. They look like old shipping containers that have had the front removed and replaced with chain links so that the players can see. Again, the stadium not necessarily built for baseball, but they do a really nice job converting it, rolling up the bleachers in right field forming uh, a big wall out there, a black tarp covering it. Massey readies, fires this one inside, nearly nicked Olsen. There's a nice job standing in there too. A lot of guys you see whenever a pitch comes in towards them, they'll kind of back out of the way, jump out of the box, that kind of stuff. That one, he just stood there and if it hit him, it hit him and he would have taken the free base.
count is one and two, two outs, runner on second base. Massey looking to get out of the fifth without allowing a run. This pitch way off line. About two feet into the left-handed batter's box. Olsen's a righty himself, so Stanky has to dive over to make the play on his backhand. Yeah, definitely a pitch that kind of got away there. Now where you want to put it, and now you even up the count too. Two, two, two outs. Massey looks in, gets the sign, sets, checks the runner on second. Kicks, comes home with it. This one hits sharply to short. Stall gloves it, fires over to first, in time on a hop. Sweeney able to pick it off, and the Golden Gophers get out of the top of the fifth without allowing a run, even though the leadoff hitter reached base. We'll head to the bottom of the fifth where the Golden Gophers look to extend their lead in just a moment on Radio K Sports. U.S. Bank Stadium in beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're just joining us alongside Connor Mockney, I'm Jason Rutman. The Golden Gophers trailed 2-0 heading into the fourth inning. However, an offensive spark that led to a rally eventually saw the Golden Gophers put four runs on the board. They now lead by a score of 4-2 as Brett Bateman steps into the box for his third plate appearance of the day. He's reached base both times, walked in the first inning, singled in the fourth, ended up coming around to score. He hits this one sharply to center field, heading back, tracking his Sears, and he'll grab the hard liner for out number one. Solid contact there from Bateman, but nothing to show for it. Yeah, there was a nice line drive by him, sitting on a pitch, and he got it, but a nice play by Sears out there in center to track one down. And he hasn't been busy today, This uh, Sears hasn't, but he makes a good play there. That'll bring up Drew Stahl. He singled as well in the fourth inning, and he'll take a slider for strike one. Up to 68 pitches is Workenti in here. Drew Stahl readies for pitch number two, hits this one softly towards third. The spin on the ball will allow it to roll foul, so Stahl fouls behind the count 0-2. Finally, some action in the Leatherneck bullpen as they have a righty standing up there getting some throws in to a bullpen catcher. Warkentian looked very strong through the first three innings. First time he faltered was in the fourth, and the Golden Gophers capitalized on it. Stahl looks at the third pitch of the at-bat high and outside, ball one. Yeah, nice job keeping an eye off on that one and he looks to get another pitch here kick in the one two stall crushes it to left field this one is going to hook foul but he got a lot of that one that ball hit way way into the sky here at u.s bank stadium yeah that one was i mean that, that had a good good carry to it but it again it just did carry foul to the left side of the pole and he'll take the next pitch for ball two. 2-2 two, two count, one out, no runners on. Drew Stahl batting 259 on the season, standing in the right-handed batter's box. Chase Stanky, the senior, on deck. 2-2 two, two pitch outside. Count will become full. 
3-2. It's been a nice at-bat so far from Stahl. He fell behind two strikes pretty early on, and he's walked it back to full. Stahl has 11 walks on the season. He also has 15 strikeouts. Here's the payoff pitch. Outside, ball four. It escapes Duran, but Stahl will leisurely jog the 90 feet down to the first base bag. I think that could have been a strike. It looked pretty close, but since the catcher Duran had dropped it and it had gotten all the way to the backstop, I think that kind of sold the call as a ball. Duran, normally a very good defensive catcher, has had a few pitches escape him today. He has, however, thrown out a golden gopher trying to steal second, so making up for that. Stanky up to bat now. He's 0 for 2 so far, however, has an RBI. His sack fly in the fourth inning to left field started off the Golden Gopher scoring. Stall on first. He's 4 for 6 in stealing so far this season. And he'll take off here. However, Stanky hits it pretty well to left, heading back towards the track, and not going to be able to make the play is Maddox. The Golden Gophers. We'll send Stahl to third. Stanky pulls up into second. Maddox seemed to lose the ball in the lights here at U.S. Bank Stadium and got himself turned around, couldn't make the play. That should have been a ball that was caught. And that's one of the worst feelings as an outfielder. I know I've experienced it too. You know, when you're tracking a ball and you just kind of lose, you don't know where it is, and then it just falls right next to you, it's a really helpless feeling out there. Now there's two runners in scoring position with one out to go. Or one out in the inning, pardon me. The roof here at U.S. Bank Stadium a little bit awkward because over the right field side of the diamond, it is blacked out. However, over left field, it is glass and the sun is shining through. So it makes it challenging for the outfielders to track the ball sometimes, as we saw there. Maddox unable to secure it. The Golden Gophers now have their best hitter in Jack Kelly up with two on, one out. And Kelly had a good at-bat last time up, and he drew a walk, which came around to score. Kelly ahead in the count, 2-0 and oh here. On deck, Otto Grimm. He's one for two on the day. These are positions where Kelly thrives. He's hitting 436 when runners are on, and when runners are in scoring position, he's hitting 345. So really good. Infield playing in. Kelly hits this one hard. Right center field heading back to the track, it is off the black tarp in play. Kelly around second, look to third, and will end up heading back towards the second base bag. The Gophers will get one more run. Chase Stanky from second was holding up, making sure that that pitch, or excuse me, that ball wasn't gonna be caught. So he only advances to third, but Otto Grimm, who has hit 450 with runners in scoring position, will come up to the plate for the Golden Gophers, who now lead 5-2. to two. Yeah, That one was close. That hit the top, uh, the, the middle of that black tart, but over the middle is a big yellow line indicating the home run line, and he just missed it, too. Hit to nearly the deepest part of the ballpark. That ball was probably hit a good 380 feet. Is this one hit by Grimm into left field? The Gophers will score two more. Otto Grimm, a two RBI single past the shortstop Bottoletto. Minnesota suddenly is starting to blow this thing open. It's seven to two. Yeah, nice job by Grimm here. The infield was playing in, looking to gun out a man at home if he decided to go on a ground ball. And it was just a hot liner right past the shortstop and it brought in two to now, as you said, extend it to a seven to two lead. Boston Marilla steps up for Minnesota. One for two on the day, grounded out to the shortstop last time he was up. Warkentian, who had looked so strong through the first three innings, has now given up seven runs. Runner takes off for second on the pitch. That throw down in time, but the shortstop dropped the ball. Bottoletto unable to scoop it up off the bounce. A good throw by Duran, but again, the turf here might be playing a factor, Connor. Looked like it took a lower bounce than Bottoletto was expecting. And Otto Grimm swipes his first bag of the season. And looked like that slide two by Grimm was really awkward as he came up and he was kind of over the bag and he ended up having to reach back out with his foot to keep on the, on the, on the base. Swing and a miss here for strike one. Count 
one and one to Boston Marilla. Batting 280 on the season. On base percentage sitting at 360. And excuse me, that is the second stolen base of the season for Otto Grimm, not the first. Pitch number three, high to Boston Marilla. Shortstop here playing deep. Second baseman Santarelli pretty close to the bag, holding on Grimm, who isn't the fastest player on this team, but certainly isn't the slowest. Playing right field for Minnesota today. Kicking the pitch. Hit to second. Santarelli there. Tosses over to first for out number two. So Barilla, excuse me, Marilla will grab a seat on the bench, but he advances Grimm to third base. Ronnie Sweeney up next for Minnesota. That was a nice job stealing earlier in that at bat, because if Grimm hadn't, that would have been a 4-6-3 double play to end the inning. With Sweeney stepping into the left-handed batter's box, the Leathernecks will shift accordingly. Three players to the right side of second base. Kicking the pitch. Sweeney hits this one a mile high, but way foul. He timed that one up to a T, but unable to keep it in between the foul lines. So the count 0-1. Yeah, that was a nice piece of contact there. But like you said, just couldn't square it up enough. Get, he had the right size, but the wrong shape. It's a good saying there, Connor. Thank you. It's a hawkism. A hawkism. Chicago win at heart. This pitch in there, ball one. Taking his time is Sweeney, too. He knows that Workentian likes to, to go fast, like we've mentioned a couple times today. So he's taking his sweet time getting back in the box. One and one, two outs. Here's the pitch. Sweeney fouls this one off towards the Golden Gopher bullpen. Players diving out of the way. The exposed bullpen's a little bit troublesome here occasionally at U.S. Bank Stadium. As one might like to say, a little bit of an ugly finder coming through there, but yeah, the bullpen situation's a little a little different. They got some folding chairs out there right next to the cargo ship bullpen. Or a uh, dugout, pardon me. 1-2, swung on and missed, strike three. The frustrating day at the plate continues for Sweeney. It's his second K of the afternoon, but the Golden Gophers put three runs on the board in the fifth. They lead seven to two, and the top of the sixth coming up when we return on Radio K Sports. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We're going to come back from commercial break a little bit earlier. We're going to talk to you about the Sports Hour podcast. It's the sports podcast of Radio K Sports, brought to you by uh, myself and Jason Rutman and May Longo as well. We have our newest episode coming out this Tuesday. And as you see on the screen, it's every you know, 6 to 7 p.m. on Tuesdays. This will come out. You can get it on the Radio K Sports website and anywhere else that you get your podcasts. And we got a lot of fun stuff on this uh, this podcast this week, Jason. We talk about athlete, athletes we've met, go for sports roundup, and a really cool interview with May and her brother. Yeah, May's brother playing baseball for the University of Michigan. So May went out to Omaha, Nebraska to see them play this weekend as the inning begins with a sharply hit ball by Santarelli that will find the gap in between first and second roll into right field for a single. So, one on, no outs. Massey's still dealing for the Golden Gophers, but an exciting interview with May and her brother, a little sibling love on there, and it's sure to be a great podcast, so make sure to tune in. 
Yeah, like we said, every Tuesday, 6 to 7 p.m., it comes out on the radio and on RadioK.org, and you can get it anywhere else. You get your podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any other app like that. So go ahead and give it a listen, give it a check, subscribe, and you'll never miss an episode. That'll bring up Nick Mitchell. Runner takes off for second. Stanky couldn't corral the ball immediately, so able to steal second with ease is Santarelli. Not a great start with a runner almost immediately in scoring position for Western Illinois, who tries to desperately claw back into this contest down five. Nick Mitchell so far today, a strikeout looking in the first, a fly out to left field in the third, looking to make a splash here with a runner in scoring position in the sixth. Minnesota up 7-2. to two. This pitch in there, heater for strike one. Looks like he might have gotten the benefit of a call there. Looked to be one of those 50-50 pitches, kind of outside, kind of not. And he got the, got the call there, did Massey. Mitchell crouched in the batter's box. Check swing, ruled a strike. He didn't go around on it, but the pitch caught enough of the plate to go for strike two. One and two is the count, no outs. Santarelli singled on the first pitch he saw of the half inning. Stole second just a moment to go, so that's where he sits at. No shift for the Golden Gopher infielders or outfielders. J.P. Massey, the 6'5 righty sets, comes home with it. This one in the dirt, blocked by Stanky. Santarelli got pretty far off that second base bag and had to jog back with some pace in order to avoid the throw down. Yeah, he's a little springy out there on the bases. Maybe trying to draw some attention out there, draw a throw so he can try to take third. Western Illinois scored one run in the second inning and in the third inning. They've been held silent in the first, fourth, and fifth. Minnesota silent in the first three as this pitch swung on and missed. Strike three. The high heater is strikeout number five for J.P. Massey. A lot of his strikeouts have come on the off-speed pitch, but this time he threw a fastball right by him, kind of changing it up a little bit. And that was a nice pitch by Massey to get the first out of the inning. Dylan Sears stepping up to the Pentagon now for Western Illinois. He has lined out to Bateman in center field and also struck out swinging so far in this game. Batting in the four spot for the Leathernecks as Massey steps off to check on the runner at second. I don't think any real, this is kind of just like to keep him honest a little bit, no real attempt as Stahl was nowhere near the bag and neither was Merrilla. Massey sets hands at his waist, now brings him up to fire. This one hit back, caught by Massey, thrown to second. It could not be caught by Drew Stahl, but the question now becomes, is J.P. Massey okay? That was a blazing line drive that he somehow caught. A dangerous comebacker there. I mean, that that's that's one of those, those instincts you can't really teach. That's just something that in the moment, it just happens. You know, you get a shot right back at you, especially off a metal bat, and that was just a rocket he was able to catch. Massey immediately waved off Chase Stanky, who nearly sprinted out to the mound to check on his status, but after going back to home plate, the Golden Gophers bench calls timeout, and they're going to send out one of their trainers to make sure that Massey is okay. The whole infield circled around him. I wonder if they're giving a little bit of time, too, for both the pitchers that they have warming up in the bullpen. Give them some, a couple extra pitches here. Western Illinois has sat down their pitcher in the bullpen, but Minnesota's got a lefty and a righty warming up, getting ready to go in case Massey hits any sort of trouble. The Gophers will break their huddle at the mound. Massey walking back towards second base, resetting himself. A scary moment if you're just joining us. A comebacker that Massey somehow caught. That thing was absolutely smoked, and he's somehow able to get leather on him. Tried to double off the runner Santarelli at second base, but Stahl was unable to hang on to the throw. So two outs, runner remains on second. First pitch of the at-bat, 
in the dirt. Strike one on the swing, but it bounced away from Chase Stanky, so Santarelli will swipe third. Yeah, he might have had an opportunity, but Stanky was down on his knees and probably wouldn't have been able to get any sort of good momentum on that throw to throw him out. It's probably a good, good idea to hold on to it. Up to bat, Sam Maddox. He'll take another pitch, strike two called, falls behind quickly 0-2. Maddox, one for two in the game so far, singled in his first plate appearance in the second inning, grounded out to the shortstop in the fourth. Western Illinois is only two for seven today with runners in scoring position. That's been kind of a sore spot all year for him. Timeout called by the home plate umpire. It looks like Maddox was the one who requested it as Massey took a little bit of extra time there on the mound. Has a few pitches to play around with here. Could go back to the heater, which has been effective. He does, but it's high for ball one. Yeah, just similar to how he struck out... Uh, I believe it was Mitchell earlier, in, or Sears, pardon me, in uh, this inning with that high fastball looking to go back to it. One and two, two outs, kicking the pitch. Check swing, cold strike three. The Gophers get out of the inning, leave a Leatherneck stranded at third base, and they will have an opportunity to extend their five-run lead in the bottom of the sixth when we come back on Radio K Sports. Welcome back to U.S. Bank Stadium. The Golden Gophers lead the Western Illinois Leathernecks 7-2. Jason Ruttman, Connor Mockney here. Connor, the Golden Gophers have their last few games here at U.S. Bank Stadium. They'll transition over to Siebert Field on campus. That should help them as hopefully they'll be able to draw more of a crowd assuming that the spring weather in Minnesota holds. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, it's a really nice stadium. It's it's central to campus, so people don't have to go travel downtown like they would here to U.S. Bank Stadium in order to get to these games. Like you said, the weather's a big factor for it, too, as long as it's nice out and, you know, it, it, it'll draw some, some good crowds. A smattering of fans here at U.S. Bank Stadium, if I had to estimate, I'd say about 250, 300. A little bit hard to judge in a stadium that seats about 68,000. Yeah, and it's also not meant for baseball either. Up for the Golden Gophers is Brady Council. He had a two RBI double back in the Golden Gophers four run fourth inning. Stands in as the leadoff hitter here. Hits this one up towards the first baseman. That's all red who gets under it and grabs it for out number one. On the mound now for Western Illinois, Jack Carberry, the Golden Gophers, were able to chase the starter, Jace Warkentian. He finished with seven runs against him. Not all of them earned, but right now, number 19, Carberry, 6'3", 255, a senior from... Palos Heights, Illinois. Yeah, and out of the bullpen, he has he, he struggled in the last two, couple games that he's been out there. He has a 15 ERA in the last two games, one against Butler and one against Northern Colorado. 
And so his ERA right now is up to 736. Carberry fires this one in there to Andrew Willite for strike one. One and one is the count. Willite 0 for 2, a strikeout and a flyout to center in his two plate appearances. He rips this one to first base, scooped up by Allred, and he'll touch up on the bag unassisted. Two quick outs for the Golden Gophers. Carberry, kind of an interesting pitching motion, Connor. He is pretty methodical with how he goes, but as soon as he gets into the motion, it becomes very, very janky. Which can result in a lot of you know pitches that you don't really know where they're going to go. A lot, you know, a lot of loss in control when you have that kind of motion. Fires this one in here for strike one. He throws very much so overhand. The, his arm rotating from 12 to 6. A lot of pitchers you'll see go from 11 to 5 or even 10 to 4, but he has his arm skyward with the ball in it right before his release, and he rifles this one in there for strike two. Reminds me a lot of uh, an old White Sox pitcher, Nate Jones, who kind of just had his arm all the way up top and then would come out over. It's definitely not something you see every day. Makes it a little bit easier for the batter to pick up on the ball as they're able to see it for an extra millisecond or two before release. But he has the Gophers on the ropes here. 0-2 to Willite outside for ball one. And excuse me, that's Bateman now at the plate. Yeah, it's also definitely weird. He comes up and down with his gloves twice. Uh, before he gets into his motion, which is no, also not something you see. Bateman swings at the fastball, shoots it foul towards the gopher bullpen. Count one and two. Bateman stands in the left-hand batter's box, crouched, and fouls another pitch off. Have not seen many off-speed pitches so far in this inning from Carberry. Fastball heavy guy. Throws with a lot of power, able to generate a lot of force using his 6'5 frame. Bateman, a good fastball hitter though. Readies. Here's the pitch. This one high and outside. Ball two. Good at bat so far from Bateman, which is something we've come to expect. He's been someone who takes a lot of pitches during their at-bats. And this is a good job now because he will allow the hitters behind him to see what Carberry has. The 2-2 to Bateman fouled off down the third baseline again. I like this. This is a good at bat. This is this is good for the entire team because considering Carberry might go next inning depending on how this one shakes out, I think it's going to be good because now, like we said, it gives a, uh, the rest of the guys in the lineup a lot of opportunities to see what he's got. Quick pitch here. It's high. Count is full. Bateman has walked 10 times this season, has only struck out 11 times in a team high 90 at bats. He also leads the team with 29 hits and 18 runs scored. The payoff pitch, kicking the 3 2. Bateman swings, drives it to left center. Calling out for it and making the grab is Sam Maddox in left. The Gophers go down in order in the bottom of the sixth. We'll head to the top of the seventh. Connor Mockney will resume his play-by-play -play duties when we return on Radio K Sports.
Hello and welcome back to U.S. Bank Stadium. We are here for the top of the seventh with Minnesota leading 7-2. to two. I am Connor Mockney, joined alongside Jason Rutman here with Radio K Sports. J.P. Massey is still out on the mound looking to complete his seventh inning of work. He's only at 74 pitches, so he's been pretty efficient outside of the second and third innings. First pitch is off speed and inside. That'll be to the hitter, uh, Toby Allred who has an RBI single earlier in this game. Next pitch is going to be down and low, 2-0 and count. Gophers still have a righty and a lefty up in their bullpen as the day starting to near an end for J.P. Massey. But aside from a few blips in the second and third, like you said, Connor, he has looked really, really solid today. Yeah, and that third pitch of the at-bat is inside for ball three. So a 3-0 count now for Allred, who then takes that one inside, and a four-pitch walk from Massey to begin the inning. That is his first walk of the day, and not a great spot. Looked like he was overthrowing there a little bit, the ball coming out of his hand early, a few pitches riding high. Fatigue probably a factor here as he approaches 80 pitches, but Massey has had six days of rest since he last threw. In step, step C.J. Richmond, the designated hitter, he singled to center last time, and he swings and misses on that first pitch by Massey, who now jumps ahead 0-1. Richmond, only six hits and 41 at-bats this season. That equates to a .146 batting average. Yeah, not great, but he has made some good contact so far today. As Massey is set, not a big lead from the runner at first. Ground ball to... Sweeney, he's got it. He'll throw to second for one. Throw back to first, not in time. They'll only get one. Richmond was hustling down the line. Looked like it was a little slow to develop on Sweeney's side, too. He had to kind of make some room with the runner in the baseline, but they were able to get that lead out at second. Good job by Sweeney there. Ball not hit too hard at him. He has to charge in, glove it, turn to second, and he's able to make an accurate throw. Then he hustles back to first with some real speed there and makes it close. In steps the catcher, Adam Duran, who's 0 for 2 today so far. Again, Richmond with not a big lead there. The first pitch is going to be high. Ball 1 against Duran. You got a 1 and 0 count. Richmond is not someone who's going to steal. He has no attempts on the year. Obviously hasn't been caught. The next pitch Duran has to duck out of the way as that pitch came in. They seem to be crowding the inside of the plate, too, as a right-handed hitter. But that one came up and in, and he was able to duck out of the way with a 2-0 count now. Massey taking a few extra seconds to reset himself off the mound here. Control a little bit off so far in the top of the seventh, although the sample size of pitches has been limited, as you can assume. Pitch number 81 coming in. And it's going to be swing hit. Stahl knocks it down. We'll throw to second for the first out. No throw to first for a potential double play, but a nice job by Stahl on a screaming liner to slide and knock that one down and at least get one out. Yeah, really nice play by Stahl there. He's moving to his right, is able to knock it down on the backhand. The ball bounced once before it got to him, but kind of ended up being a short hop type situation. Then still had the awareness to look to second and fire it there in order to get the lead runner. Yeah, nice play by him. And now there's going to be a meeting on the mound. Minnesota will get a pitching change as Massey's night is done with six and two-thirds, five hits allowed, two runs, neither of them earned, one walk, six Ks, and 83 pitches. So a really good day from him as Minnesota will be bringing in a lefty. Yeah, it's a great bounce-back performance for J.P. Massey, who had a rough few outings coming into this one, and he'll... Head to the dugout to a very, very nice ovation here at U.S. Bank Stadium. A great performance from Massey. Like you said, no earned runs, only walked one batter, and had six strikeouts. So the Golden Gophers will head to the bullpen. Tom Scoro is the man who will take the mound for them. Scoro donning number 45 for the Golden Gophers, a redshirt senior standing at 6'3", 230 from Medicine Lake, Minnesota. Transferred from Missouri a few years back. 
and he went to Kansas State in 2017 before that, didn't appear in game action. Yeah, and overall he's been pretty good. He had two appearances uh, last series at Creighton. He went one and a third in the first game and then only had one third uh, of an inning in his uh, in the last game of the series. Uh, in that last game, he allowed no hits, no runs, no strikeouts, no walks. Got that one out pretty quickly. And then in that second game, or first game against Creighton, he went one and a third, only allowing one hit, one walk, and three Ks. So he's been pretty solid to begin the year, and as of late, he's also been really solid. The Golden Gopher bullpen has not been spectacular this year. A lot of runs given up for them. Scoro, one of the few pitchers out of the pen who has been consistent, ERA sitting at 3.12, whip 1.38. Yeah, like we said, he has been good. He's been one of those lone bright spots for this pitching staff as a whole, and it looks to keep it going against a team in Western Illinois who started out hot but has really fallen on hard times since that fourth inning. Yeah, Western Illinois, it's been a struggling or a trying season for them to say the least. Two and 17 is not where they wanted to be this deep into the year, but they've only played three games in the Summit League and they'll have an opportunity to take on some other teams, including St. Thomas, who is attempting to make the jump from D3 to D1. So right now they're pretty vulnerable in terms of how much skill they have on their team. And I think that Western Illinois should be able to pick up a few conference wins against them and potentially against a few other teams there in the Summit League as play back underway here. Scoro's first pitch is going to be low for ball one to the nine hitter Derek Bottoletto. He is one for two today. And Duran is no threat to steal. He's been caught in both of his attempts this year. Got a short lead at first with the lefty. Now he takes off, and they're going to pick him off. They're going to throw it down to second base. The throw is high from Sweeney, but he slides off the bag and will be tagged out. And that will end the inning as a beautiful pickoff attempt from Scoro. Doesn't even have to, he only throws one pitch in that inning. And the Gophers will now head to the seventh inning stretch with a 7 2 lead. And we'll be right back here on Radio K Sports. Welcome back to U.S. Bank Stadium here. I'm Connor Mark, and joined alongside Jason Roman here from Radio K Sports. And if this is something that interests you, you know, we've talked about the podcast before. Uh, we talked about some interviews that we have as well. And like the broadcast that you're listening to here, if you're ever interested in uh, being a part of Radio K Sports, uh, go ahead and look at the... Um, the email on on the screen here radio k sports at gmail.com reach out to us there and we'll have uh, plenty of opportunities for people to come join not only on the podcast but in these broadcasts as well yeah radio k sports a really great place to meet some new people make some new friends has really changed my college life for the better so if you have any interest at all please please reach out we'd be happy to have you on the crew and that first pitch from Canterbury was a strike, but then the second one here is well inside. 
It's going to be a ball. It's Drew Stahl, the shortstop, up for Minnesota. He's two or one for two today with a walk. He's come around to score both times he's gotten on base. And that pitch is swung and tipped back all the way to the backstop. So one and two now on Stahl. Drew Stahl so far grounded into a 5-4-3 double play in the first that nullified a walk to Brett Bateman. Singled in the fourth, came around to score, and then walked in the fifth. But he'll... Strike out here as Carberry gets off to a strong start in the bottom of the seventh. Yeah, swinging on a high fastball and couldn't quite catch up to it. And he is the first casualty of the inning. And now Chase Stanky will come up. He has a sack fly that brought in the first run of the game for the Gophers. And then hit a double in the fifth. He hit it to left and then came around to scores off that misplay in left field uh, by Maddox. And that first pitch is off speed and will be taken outside for a ball. It is one nothing the count. Gophers lead seven to two here in the seventh. Carberry delivers another one outside to the left-hander. This one was in the right-handed batter's box. Really never had a chance. I got an interesting number for you here, Connor. Chase Stanky has 19 hits on the season. 15 of those have been extra base hits. So his batting average only 247. His slugging percentage 623. I don't think I've really ever seen that kind of discrepancy. I can't say that I have either. I mean, that's really good that he's been able to put the ball in place at the 3-0 count now on him. And that, I mean, he's been really productive when he does. And the 3-0 pitch will be taken for a strike. It's 3-1 and one on Stanky. There's one out here in the inning. Carberry is ready to go with a pitch clock running now down to 10. Stanky is ready in the box. And here's the pitch. It'll be up and away, and Stanky will draw a walk. Base runner on now with one out here in the bottom of the seventh. The Gophers have had some really, really nice controlled at-bats where they've held off pitches that look tempting to swing at but are not in the zone, and they have received a fair amount of walks this game. I've been really impressed at how patient they've been at the plate. Already have taken five bases on ball as a team in this one. That's good because you know that shows some s sign of consistency and of you know just a good eye. It's really gonna play well when they get into the Big Ten series. Now here's the pitch from Carberry and rocked into right field. It will get down for a base hit. Jack Kelly with his third or second hit of the day, and now runners on first and second with one out. That'll bring up Otto Grimm, who is two for three in this one. Had a three for four game last night, so. He's looking really, really solid here for the Golden Gophers and not the man you want to have up if you're the Leathernecks with two runners on and only one out. Yeah, Grimm's made a lot of really solid contact, especially to the left side past the shortstop where there is a really big hole between short and third. Let's see if he takes it there yet again. Big hole between first and second as well with the second baseman holding on the runner at second. And that first pitch is down in the dirt, blocked beautifully by their catcher, Duran. And it's 1-0. and Otto Grimm has two singles. He's driven in three runs so far today. He's two for three. Come around to score once. He gets his fourth at bat of the day. Carberry looking at second. No move. Will deliver home. And that fastball is outside. 2-0 count for Grimm. It's interesting what the Leathernecks are doing defensively here. They have Santorelli basically holding on Stanky at second. Stanky, not a, at all a threat to steal third base. He's pretty fast for a catcher, but he's no Brett Bateman. That third pitch is well inside. Having to dive out of the way was grim, and it's going to be a 3-0 count. I don't think he's going to swing here personally. I think you're going to have to wait for Carberry to throw to him to give him something to hit. So if I was John Anderson, the manager of the Minnesota Golden Gophers, I would just let him take this pitch here I would agree Grimm has 10 walks to only seven strikeouts this season so not overly aggressive at the plate very very good eyes and knows the strike zone well here's the pitch and it's right down the middle obviously he takes it there and it's a 3-1 count now still a really good hitters count ahead in the count by two Otto Grimm takes his time getting back into the box his foot's basically on the very very back of the left-handed batter's box we talked about how Carberry throws hard. He's trying to give himself as much time as possible to register the pitch and 
take a good hack at it. And that 3-1 pitch will be outside, and the bases are now loaded after the walk from Grimm. It's his 11th on the season, and bases are loaded for Boston Merrilla, who had a good hit back in the second, and it was the first hit of the game for the Gophers, and stood as their only hit for a little while. And he looks to get back into the hit column as he's one for three. Great opportunity for Boston Merrilla, who has had a solid game so far defensively. He's looked really strong offensively. He's put the ball in play all three times he's been to the plate, has only reached base on one of those three swings, however. A little fun fact here, too, as that first pitch is inside for a ball. Merrilla is betting 200 with runners in scoring position, but when the bases are loading, it's betting 1,000. And the next pitch here is going to be fouled back into the screen, one and one. Gophers lead by five, and they also lead in the hit column by four. They have nine and compared to the Leathernecks, five, but they do have more errors than Western Illinois as they lead two to one. Carberry ready. Corners are in for the Leathernecks. Double play depth from the middle of the infield. Here's the pitch. It's going to go off the glove. No one's going to advance. It didn't quite get far enough as the throw goes down to third, but getting back in time is the runner that's Stanky. It's going to be 2-1 count now. Stanky, a little bit aggressive there on the base paths, up five. He advanced about 20 feet, uh, 25 feet down the line there as the ball popped out of the glove of Duran. Duran hustled to it, slid on one shin pad, and tossed it back to third. Stanky has to dive back in. Here's a play, and it's hit right back at second base. He's going to throw it to the second for one. Throws down to first, and they will get the double play. Merrilla hits into a 4-6-3, and Gophers come away with no runs in the seventh. We will now head to the top of the eighth. Gophers up by five here on Radio K Sports. Welcome back here for the top of the eighth here at U.S. Bank Stadium. Derek Bottoletto will lead it off for the Western Illinois Leathernecks. Tom Scoro still on the mound. He only had to throw one pitch last inning after picking off uh, the catcher, Duran. And that first pitch is going to be a strike. He's ahead in the count 0-1. Standing on the extreme first base side of the rubber, left-handed Scoro winds, will throw, and gets a nice strike low in the zone, and it's 0-2 pretty quickly. Last time Bottoletto was up, a controversial play at first base, hustling down the line, and he bunted towards third. Kelly picked it up on a bare hand, tossed over to first, and the first base umpire said it was in time for the out. Sweeney stretching all the way 
out extending that arm and picking the ball off the ground on one hop, but Bottoletto and his head coach Andy Pasco disagreed strongly to say the least. Yeah, Probably a good three-minute argument out there between the first base ump and Coach Pasco, but call didn't change, and in the scorebook it says uh, sack bunt to the third baseman. Next two pitches were outside, and so is the third one. So from 0-2 to 3-2, and it's a full count now. Scorer with three straight off-speed pitches into the right-handed batter's box to the lefty. And that something's got to change. If you didn't hit it once, you're probably going to hit it twice or a third time. Here's the payoff pitch. Swing and just fouled off. Being able to get a piece of it was Bottoletto, and he keeps his at-bat alive. It's important not to walk Bottoletto here for Tom Scoro, knowing that he is definitely someone who could steal second with, with ease. He has a lot of speed, and then also you have the best hitter in Olsen on deck. And that pitch is up and in, and it hits him. So no walk, even though it would have been anyway. But Bottoletto was hit. It kind of came up high, maybe like upper back, shoulder area as he ducked out of the way. And as you said, here comes Corey Olsen, their best hitter in this lineup. Olsen so far has one of the two RBIs in this game for Western Illinois. He hit a double back in the third inning that played at a run. First pitch is going to be low to the right-hander, Olsen. He's going to have 1-0 count in his favor. Something I was always taught as a lefty pitcher like Scoro here is that first pitch you always want to throw over when you have a runner on. No throw over there, just kind of to keep him honest. Bottoletto's got a decent sized lead. No go. And that one's hit into the outfield. Little blooper. Out goes Stanky. And he's going to make the catch falling down. No, he doesn't. Ball's going to be thrown into second base for the force. Stanky, or Stahl, pardon me, was running out there into you know, no man's land. No man's land, really, with Bateman and Wilhite converging in. And he went to go for it, and he fell back and just missed it nearly a really good play. He probably sprinted a good 80, 85 feet from his position at shortstop to the middle of left center field to make that play. The outfielders playing a few steps too deep to reach that ball on the fly. And unfortunately, he dropped it, but Willie right there to back him up, fired it into second base to get the lead runner. Here's a ground ball to third. They'll throw it to second for one, over to first, not in time. Santorelli was really quick there, going up the line. Another force, but there's now two outs here in the eighth, and a runner is on first now for Nick Mitchell, the three-hitter. In the meantime, Tom Scoro still hasn't allowed much solid contact to these Leathernecks who are batting right now. A lot of you know, bloopers to the outfield that have been caught, or in the case of Maryland, not caught, but still an out was uh, Recorded picked nonetheless. up. Yeah, and a lot of ground balls there. So the Golden Gophers' defense has been busy, but in a good way. Throw over to first, no real attempt there as the runner gets back pretty easily. Mitchell is 0 for 3 today. He's got two strikeouts and a fly out to left. He looks to change his fortunes here, not go 0 for 4. Scoro, ready, looking at the runner with a small lead. Throws in, and that one is just outside in the right hand of batter's box. Just missed, 1 0 is the count. Scoro, the tall lefty, will get his sign. Comes set. Again, no, not a big lead as the runner now takes off on a fake bunt. Will throw down from Stinky to second. And he's just in safely. A late call there by the umpire. I think he wanted to just make sure that he had him. But as Stahl went down, couldn't quite get the tag in time. And it looks like Santorelli has his first, or his, 10th stolen base of the season. Really nice throw there from Stanky. I mean, a great jump by Santorelli. That play shouldn't have even been close, but Stanky made it about as close as possible, putting the ball right on the money on the fly. Stahl applies the tag just a millisecond too late. The umpire making sure he hung on to the ball, checking to see if the hand remained on the bag and deemed that the runner did get there in time. So two on, one, two count after a strike there from Scoro. And a runner on second. The Leathernecks are 0 for 6 with two outs today and are 2 for 8 with runners in scoring position. 
So not great for them. And those two hits came early on in the game in the second and third inning and haven't had much success since. Scoro ready with the 1-2 count. Here's the pitch. It'll be down. Nice block by Stanky. It's 2-2. Two and two. No advance from the runner here and no real look of any sort of pickoff attempt as Merla is playing in short right field. Pretty deep for second there. Escaro's set gets his sign. Here's the 2 2. Swing and just getting a piece of that as Mitchell. He just does stay alive and avoided his third strikeout momentarily as that one was just foul. Nice job by Mitchell there, taking a hack at an emergency swing kinda in order to stay alive. Western Illinois is not gonna have too many more opportunities at the plate with two outs in the top of the eighth, trailing by five runs, so each at bat counts. 2-2 two -two coming in from Scoro, and he gets him looking, Tom Scoro with a nice inning and a third for the Gophers, and he gets out of the inning with a strikeout looking. And that will end the eighth, the top of the eighth. We will be right back for the bottom of the eighth here on Radio K Sports. And here we are back for the bottom of the eighth. Leading it off will be Ronald Sweeney, who's had kind of a rough day, pretty indicative of his season. He's 0 for 2 with two strikeouts, but did have a walk in the fourth and advanced to third. Carberry is still out on the mound for Western Illinois. He's up to 34 pitches now at that one, which is taken just outside for a ball. 1-0 is the count. Sweeney had his average now dipped down to 2-11. Already wasn't pretty high coming into this game. Carberry's ready to go. Here's the pitch. Swing and popped up just in foul territory. And it is going to escape everyone and just get about two rows out of play. Now one and one is the count. Carberry entering his third inning of work here. He's been solid since entering the game back in the sixth inning. No runs allowed. Pitching has not been the strong suit for Western Illinois this year, as we've mentioned a few times here, but Carberry has shut the Gophers down. Looks like that pitch might have gotten tipped just barely. It did go into the glove of the catcher, and it will be strike two regardless. Go back to Carberry. He has 26 walks, only against 19 Ks on the year, which is not great, but he's looked pretty good so far today. The 1 2 will be taken outside. It's 2 and 2 now. After that one. Pretty good day so far from the Gopher offense. The fourth and the fifth innings are really where they got things going. They scored all their runs there. Now here's the pitch from Carberry. Going to be lined down into the right field line, but will go out of play. Foul ball. 
Sweeney was just ahead on that one again. He's had a couple of those today where he's just ahead but had pretty good hits if they had been fair. You're absolutely right. The timing for him just hasn't really been there today. He struggled to track the off-speed pitches. His contact with fastballs has been good, but he's been pulling them foul. And he'll strike out again here. Yeah, that one was looking. That was on the outside corner. He wanted to swing, but he held up and it ended up being a strike call anyway. And he strikes out for the third time today. First time looking. Well, here's my concern with Sweeney. That's his 24th strikeout of the season. In 72 at-bats, his strikeout rate is 33%. That is dangerously high for someone who is going into his final season of eligibility, a redshirt senior, someone who is looking to play after college. Yeah, that's definitely not, definitely not how you want to continue or at least start the season going into now your Big Ten season after this series. It's that first pitch to Brady Council is a strike. And the second one kind of crosses up the catcher a little bit. It's going to be one and one to Brady Council, who has a, had a big RBI double. He drove in two back in the fourth inning to give Minnesota a 4-2 lead at the time. And now he hits this one to right field. Two players converging. It'll be the right fielder, Mitchell, who was there to make the play. Two quick outs here in the eighth. Now with this, it'll bring up the left fielder, Andrew Wilhite who is 0 for 3 today. He had a strikeout in the third. He f had a pop-up to center field and had a three unassisted back in the sixth. So he's looking to change his fortunes here, put a hit in the hit column for the first time today. He takes that first pitch high for ball one. Will Height has his average now at 153, which is not great. It's been a struggle for him as well. Here at the bottom of the lineup. Carberry's next pitch is going to be outside as well. 2-0. and He's got a good hitting count. Hopefully he can make something happen. Well, Ed is one of those guys that head coach John Anderson loves as a leader on the field, loves as a leader in the locker room, thinks he has a great glove defensively, which we saw earlier this game. He made a spectacular dive and catch, but his bat really has not found a good groove this season so far. Only 11 hits in 72 attempts. Yeah, and that's a pitch right there that he might want to have back a 2-0 fastball right down the middle. As a hitter, that's the one you're always looking for if you get to that spot and he wasn't able to pull the trigger. Carberry with the 2-1. will be fouled into the netting. will be even now at 2-2. Two two. Will Height looking to get it back to Bateman, who's at the top of the order with a 2-2 two -two count. Carberry is up to now 42 pitches on the day. 43 is delivered here. That one's high. It's a full count. Will Height with a nice job this at bat. Other than that 2 0 miss uh, he would probably like to have back, he's had a pretty good at bat. He's drawn it full and getting some more pitches out of Carberry, who isn't used to really throwing this much out of the pen. Here's the full count pitch. Swung back and fouled. He'll stay alive for one more pitch. You're absolutely right. This has been a great at-bat by Will Height. He's timing up the pitcher, Carberry. He's fouled two off into the netting, which means that the timing is good on them. It's, he just is chopping under him a little bit. If he can square one up, I would venture to guess that it's going to find a hole. He's due for a hit. And another foul ball on a full count pitch yet again from Will Height. He's battled up to about seven, eight pitches, which would be a pretty quality at-bat. And he's staying alive here with a full count. Carberry is ready. So is Will Height in the left-handed batter's box. Here's the pitch. Swung back and fouled yet again. It's four times this at bat. He's fouled one into the netting directly behind home plate. He's getting really, really close, but just undercutting it a little bit. Yeah, he seems to be right on it. But if he can just get up a little bit more with the bat and find more of a sweet spot, he'll be able to drive it. Carberry is ready. Here's the pitch, and it's a walk. Nice job by Will Height, an extended at-bat, and he draws a two-out walk, and the top of the order will come back around for yet another at-bat for Bateman. A very, very well-earned walk there for Will Height. A long at-bat, I believe that was nine pitches. Yes. And he does his job, gets it back to the top of the order. Brett Bateman batting just a hair under 320 is up now for the Golden Gophers, searching for his second hit of the day. He's also made some good contact today. He's 
walked, hit a single, and then hit two balls pretty well to the outfield, both of which were caught. Will Height's going to steal a pump fake from the catcher, and he will throw it down to second, not in time. That pump fake really did him in, and it's a stolen base for Will Height, his sixth on the year. I'm not exactly sure why Duran pump fake there. I wonder if he never got a good grip on the ball on the transition from his mitt to his hand, but he shouldn't have even thrown that down once he pump fake. Will Height's too fast, and had he overthrown it, he would have allowed another base to be taken. 1-0 count here to Bateman. Here's the pitch. He's going to hit it. Oh, nice diving play by the third baseman. He'll get up and throw it to first. Beautiful job by Olsen. Oh, my goodness. What a way to retire the side. One that was aimed and had a number for the left field corner. Gets snagged by the third baseman, and he will end the inning for the Gophers. And we will stay on here. No commercial break before we head to the top of the ninth. The last inning is Minnesota will make a pitching change. So... Connor, the reason that we're staying on is uh, to give the viewers and myself an opportunity to thank you for everything you've done for Radio K Sports. Because there isn't a ton of space at Siebert Field, this is likely going to be the last Radio K Sports baseball broadcast of the year. And as a senior, that means it's going to be your last broadcast. So thank you for everything that you've done for Radio K. What, what has Radio K meant to you over the years? I mean, it's, it's meant a lot, you know. Um... Well, first off, thank you for the very kind words. I, I really appreciate it. Um, but Radio K has really meant a lot. You know, this is always something that I've kind of dreamed about doing. Um, you know, I, I really never thought it would be attainable to do something like this. Um, and it, it's given me an opportunity to not only, you know, watch and commentate and talk about sports, which is something that I do quite a bit, um, but it's also helped me meet a lot of really great people. And it's made my time here at Minnesota just you amazing and I'm really appreciative of all that it's, it's it's done and thank you very much for those kind words I feel obligated to ask you've done Radio K Sports for a few years here now do you have a favorite call or a favorite game that you have been a part of the broadcast team for uh I mean calling the uh the upset win against Wisconsin in football this past year was pretty cool um Sammy Walker's game winner against Penn State a couple weeks ago. An excellent, hockey. an excellent call, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I would probably put those at the top of the list that come to mind. I mean, Crookshank's goal last weekend against Michigan was pretty nice just because of the electricity uh, in that building early on. Um, those would probably be some of my favorites. Well, Connor, thank you very much for sharing with us, and thank you for doing so much for Radio K. Don't worry, you're still going to get to hear more of Connor as the broadcast, or uh, as the podcast director. We still have plenty more sports hours coming out before the end of the year, so make sure to tune into those, and we thank you for tuning in to this game here on Radio K Sports as we're ready to get the top of the ninth underway. Yeah, pretty quick game. It's been blowing by so far, and as we stated before, Minnesota has a new pitcher on the mound. It'll be Josh Culliver, number 36. He comes in with nine innings pitched on the year and a 5 ERA. He's got 10K, six walks. And that first pitch is going to be ripped down the right field line and will get out of play. Foul ball. A loud start to the top of the ninth in that first pitch. A nice swing there by Dylan Sears, who has had a quiet game himself, 0 for 3 with a strikeout, but finally put some good contact on that one <laughs> unfortunately for him next pitch did not go so well a very off balance swing strike two those are the absolute worst when you're a hitter when you absolutely flail like that you're never going to hear the end of it from your teammates that's for sure as it's 0-2 Culliver's got him on the ropes here's the pitch swung and hit down the right field line it is going to get fair and into the corner it's going to be a lead off double as the throw comes into second base was kind of close, but Stahl was not really looking there as he was attempting a potential throw to third. But a leadoff double from Dylan Sears, his second hit of the game, or second hit of the game, pardon me. And it's a hot start from the Leathernecks. Josh Culliver left a pitch hanging over the middle of the plate, and Sears, too talented of a hitter to let that one go by. Culliver 
in his own right, has had a pretty decent season. Nine innings pitched, five earned runs, ten strikeouts to his name. That, ERA coming in at 5.00. Sorry about that. That first pitch to Sam Maddox, the left fielder, is going to be outside for a ball. He's one for three on the day with a single in the second, which came around to score for the first run of the game, and it hasn't done much since. Culliver looks, and a swing and a miss on a high fastball. Some obvious disappointment there from Maddox, thinking he missed a good one. Maddox took a big hack at that one, but on those high pitches, it's better to shorten up your swing a little bit and almost tomahawk those into the outfield gaps. It's that hard one, to get on top of those. Yeah, that one might have been a little bit high for his liking, but still a good cut at it. Next pitch is going to be up and in. Going to be a ball outside of the zone. Culliver now falls behind 2-1 and one with no outs and a runner on second base off after the leadoff double from Dylan Sears, who's the four-hitter for the Leathernecks. Culliver looks in. He's standing on the extreme first base side of the rubber. The right-hander delivers. Swing and a miss yet again on the fastball. I think he's got Maddox sitting on it, and he's just late. That looked like a two-seamer to me with a lot of movement from the right-hander. Typically, you see a little bit more movement on the two-seamers from a lefty, but that one cut inside probably a good six inches. Really, really impressive stuff from Culliver. Yeah, he's had some really good movement on a lot of these, these fastballs that he's thrown so far. He's looked pretty nasty. Culliver's set. Time is called. So we'll have to step off and do the 2 2 again. Normal defensive setup, straight away in the outfield. Kind of close to the line is a third baseman for the Gophers. Everything else is straight up. The 2 2 will be outside. It's a full count now for Maddox. A little bit more background on Josh Culliver for you listeners. Red shirt senior pitcher standing at 6 2 205. Hails from Omaha, Nebraska, went to Creighton Prep for his high school education. Came to Minnesota as the number three overall prospect and, type, and top right-handed pitcher in Nebraska by, pro, by, by PBR. excuse me. And that full count pitch will be taken for strike three. Culliver paints the corner with a fastball, and he sets down Maddox for the third time today. Now it brings up Toby Allred the first baseman who drove in that first run of the game for Western Illinois. And he comes in at 1-2 and two with a walk and an RBI single and a strikeout back in the fourth. Culliver set. Defense playing kind of deep in the infield. He's got his sign. Will throw, and that's strike one on the outside corner from Culliver. That was a nice pitch by him. He's really looked really good with the fastball so far as he's done pretty well with that pitch, spotting it in locations that won't get hit. Culliver taking his time. Five on the pitch clock. Sounds like football. Here's the pitch. And that one was a supposed check swing that does end up getting hit, and it gets hit foul for strike two. Now it's 0-2 is the count. I would venture to guess that Culliver wants to go back to that nice two-seamer there. Get a little bit of inside action on the right-handed all red. Let's see if he does it here. The 0-2 is a fastball. He leaves out over the plate, and it's hit foul. And all red will stay alive. Still 0-2 is the count. That did look like a two-seamer to me, but it wasn't located where Culliver wanted it. Instead of hanging out right over the middle of the plate and then cutting to the inside on all red, it started on the outside and ended up right over the middle. It was a mistake that Allred fortunately missed for the Golden Gophers. Excuse me. Fortunately for the Golden Gophers, he mistakenly missed it. Yeah, there we go. Here's the 0-2 and just outside. That's a spot that we've been getting calls Minnesota has all day, but no dice on that one, and it's 1-2 and two is the count. That was great location from Culliver. I have no clue how Allred didn't swing at that pitch. That one, I feel like on a two-strike approach you need to swing to protect and he got the benefit of the call but my goodness that was close that was a, a, a great take that's for sure um, definitely one that I think most people would swing at uh, just because like you said two strikes really close it's beautiful take from him potential pickoff just a roll over to keep the man at second guessing 
a decent lead from the runner Sears. Culliver's set. Takes a glance. Here's the one two. And that one's high. Two and two is the count after it's evened up on a high and inside fastball. Patient approach here for all red. The Western Illinois Leatherbacks, or Leathernecks, excuse me, uh, down to their final two outs of this game and still trailing by five. And part of the bottom part of the lineup is coming up too, so not a spot that's been all that productive for them. Culliver with the 2 2. Swing and foul down the third base line. And they'll do the 2 2 yet again on a pretty decent at bat from Allred as well, similar to the one that Will Height had last half inning. He gets down by two strikes and then continues to foul some off until he gets something he likes or he gets walked. So good at bat so far from him. He's been one of the most consistent hitters on this team today. And Culliver's ready. Here's a 2 2 yet again. It's down in the dirt. Nice pick by Stanky, and it's a full count now. On deck is the designated hitter, Richmond. He has a single earlier in this game, and the Gophers do not want to put two on with only one out. Remember, Dylan Sears standing at second base. Culliver looks in. He's got his sign. Takes a glance at second. Here's the pitch. It's going to be popped up in the infield. Third baseman will tag in on it, and he will make the catch. That's Jack Kelly. And now two are retired, one out to go for Minnesota. Golden Gophers looking to start a little bit of a win streak here. They won last night by a score of 11-4, to looking to win here again by a score of 7-2. to They're one out away, and it's going to be oh. Richmond donning number 42. C.J. Richmond from Indianapolis, Indiana, Park Tudor High School graduate. Big guy, 6'3", 235 as a freshman. Oh, that's a, that's a man right there. That's one, of you, that's one of the guys in high school that when you see him, like, oh, man, this is like a, a man child over here. <laughs> you know he's going to be getting some college looks, college offers, just based on that size. In the meantime, the Golden Gophers have huddled around the pitcher's mound and finally break it as the home plate umpire jogs out there in order to speed this one up. One out of way, up by five. I'm not exactly sure what they feel a need to discuss, but I'm sure that there's good reason. Yeah, I agree. I don't quite know what they're looking to do here. Maybe they're just saying if you don't get this guy, we're going to put in someone in the bullpen, as there is. They do have a reliever waiting out there. But here's the first pitch. Swung and a miss. The left-hander, Richmond, swung a one that ended up in the other batter's box. So good deception on that pitch by Culliver to get him to swing. High two-seam fastball. Very appetizing to a young and relatively inexperienced college hitter such as Richmond. Great look there from Culliver to get strike one. The 0-2 is in a similar spot, but no chase from Richmond there. Count is even at one. Again, still a runner at second. It's Dylan Sears out there who has been caught four times and has two successful steals. It's out of his six. He's two for six. Not great, but I don't think he'll be stealing here. That run really doesn't mean anything. Culliver glances at second. Now we'll throw it home. Swing and a miss. Strike two. Down to their final strike is Western Illinois. That was a very similar pitch to the first one he threw in that at bat. So you've seen him chase it twice. I wonder if he's going to chase it here too. The two-seamer has been good for Culliver and has looked really nice against Richmond here. If it's not broken, no need to fix it. I'd expect him to go back to it. And he does, and a swing and the miss. Culliver strikes out Richmond, and Minnesota will take a 2-0 lead in this series. They win this one by a score of 7-2. Absolutely beautiful job by the pitching staff outside of the second and third innings where they let up the lone runs of the game for Western Illinois. They really just came in and shut down this offense that hadn't scored much, but they just imposed their will throughout. It's a really great job, and the Golden Gopher pitching finally seems to be getting back on track. Only four runs allowed yesterday, two allowed today, and Minnesota went down early. It was 2 nothing heading into the bottom of the fourth inning, but all of a sudden, the offense came alive. So they score four in the fourth, three in the fifth, and that's all they needed, a 7-2 victory 
here in Minneapolis. Game three of this series tomorrow. Tune in to Radio K Sports. Matthew Zeichert and James Duque will have the call. Yeah, like you said, a really great game from this team. They fell behind early, and it looked like their offense would really be struggling because they went through all nine hitters after three, which is never a recipe for success, especially with how the Gophers have been playing and the bottom of the lineup not producing all that well. But finally, when they got back to the top of the lineup, they sent nine men to the plate in the fourth, got it back to the top again for the fifth, scored three more. I mean, just a, a really good job overall from this team to when they got behind, not fall too much into a hole, and then be able to battle back and get themselves a big win. Before we break down each of the scoring plays between the Golden Gophers and the Leathernecks, we want to tell you about Project Main Street, a charity that we're partnering with here at Radio K Sports. Project Main Street was founded in 2006, uh, and it raises money for patients living with ALS. The average out-of-pocket cost for an ALS patient is $250,000. So Project Main Street works to help alleviate some of the financial burden of living with the disease, helping patients focus on living their best lives, spending time with their family and friends while they can. So if you have an opportunity, check out Project Main Street's website, check out their social medias, continue, excuse me, uh, consider donating to a great cause. But we'll take a look at the scoring here. It was started off in the top of the second. First baseman for the leather, Leathernecks, Toby Allred, singles to center field. Sam Maddox scored. It's an unearned run. J.P. Massey was the pitcher at the time for the Golden Gophers. After that, in the third inning, Corey Olson doubles down the right field line. Botoletto scores. That run also unearned. So the win goes to the Gophers starter, J.P. Massey, who went six and two-thirds inning strong and let up zero, zero earned runs. Yeah, he, he looked really good outside of those couple of innings where he had a couple errors. Still looked really, really good. And he was able to find a groove later on, even after he'd given up two runs. So good job by him. And then looking now to what Minnesota had done, it all started in the bottom of the fourth with a sack fly from Chad Stanky, who drove in uh, Drew Stahl, or uh, Bateman, par Brett Bateman, pardon me. Drew Stahl advanced to second base there. And then you had Otto Grimm come in with an RBI single left. And then Brady Council fouled that up with a double down the line that drove in two to give Minnesota a 4-2 lead, which is a major turning point in that game. It absolutely was. It was the first time the Golden Gophers had been able to really rattle the starter, Jace Warkenty, and he had looked really, really strong through the first three innings. But in the fourth inning, he hit a wall, and the Golden Gophers capitalized big time. Yeah, and it also continued in the fifth when Jack Kelly continued his hot streak this year, and he doubled down the, into right center, driving home uh, Drew Stahl to make it a 5-2 game. And then Otto Grimm sing, singled yet again, and this time he drove in two to make it a 7-2 game, and that ended up being the final. So Warkentian falls to 1-3 and three on the season. Massey improves to 2-2. Two and two. The Golden Gophers improve to 7-15 and 15 as a team with one more coming up tomorrow against this Western Illinois Leatherneck squad who fell to 2-18 and 18 as their struggles continue. Yeah, they fall yet again in a game that they started out pretty strong, as we've said, but obviously that pitching kind of caught back up to them. We weren't able to stop the bleeding as Minnesota goes on a couple of runs to give them an insurmountable lead. And so, Connor, for one final time, give us the send-off. The Golden Gophers win 7-2. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us here on Radio K Sports with a final of 7-2 in favor of the Golden Gophers. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast. We know you enjoyed the outcome here. Thank you very much.